coordinate in relation to uh, minimizing any feedback. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to Political Liaison uh, of October 24th. Uh, first, again, would like to uh, look to our adoption of our agenda, looking to see if there's any uh, additions, changes, or deletions to the agenda. I do, Chief Sherilyn. Sure, Sherilyn. I'm just defer the report for the Chiefs sure. of Ontario. I just no need, problem. I'm just waiting for the documents to come in okay, from that perfect. meeting. And actually, uh, I can even further have uh, add to that as well, Sherilyn, just with my meeting that I attended with the Royal Bank <coughs> on the round table, just as an FYI. Uh, okay, so there's nothing further. I will then look to uh, mover and seconder to, oh, sorry, Greg. Oh, sorry, Greg, you'll have to go off of mute. Still on mute, Greg. Mm -hmm. There you okay. go. Um, yeah, I'd just like to be added just uh, concerning the Ontario Joint Gathering. It's being sure. held, uh, I believe, tomorrow. Yeah, and I believe Helen, myself, Tammy. Well, so we'll I get, wanted we'll... to be included. I wanted to be included in that, Mark, because I, I just wanted to get up to speed on uh, on ISC because they do cover a lot of topics. And I think 100%. that'd be helpful. I agree. Me. I think that'd be great. We'll look to a motion for travel for that uh, resolution. Uh, Greg, thanks for bringing that forward. Is there anything for, uh, further? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, I'll look to a mover to accept uh, the agenda moved by Michelle, seconder. Second. Second by Nathan. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, we do have uh, two delegations this morning. Our first delegation is uh, through our office, uh, Jill Hill, uh, who will be presenting on uh, the Gunjukwa structure, the preliminary study period, midterm report. I'll look uh, to pass the floor over to Jill. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Keith. Thank you. So this morning, I'm going to uh, verbally present. I sent the uh, hard copy of the midterm report for the Gunjukwa structure. We have now been in the structure uh, study phase for approximately five weeks. So this midterm, sorry, six weeks, this midterm report looked at the period for the first three and a half weeks of the study period. And there was a survey that was completed and sent out to uh, the councillors, as well as sent out uh, to senior admin team members to get their feedback on how they felt we were moving forward within the uh, Gunjukwa structure for the preliminary study period. So I'll just back up a little bit. The uh, counselors who are in the um, chambers received a um, hard, hard copy of the report. The hard copy was also sent um, belatedly this morning by email as well as in the Dropbox. So you can take a look at it. It is a short report because it was only covering a period of three and a half weeks. And basically the report looks at whether there was a level of comfortability in how things were going with the process changes that were made to date. And the biggest process change that has been made to date is the, the introduction of full council meetings only. In other words, no committee meetings, but everything would flow to a full council meeting table. So that's what the survey looked at and was and was asking for feedback from various uh, councillors, as well as the senior administrative leadership of Six Nations Council. Why the Six Nations leadership was included in the survey, that was at the request of this council. This council wanted feedback from senior administrative leadership about how they felt these changes would be, um, how it would impact them and their feelings about this particular structure and how they felt it was going. So they were also included. The report is um, a short report. Um, 
but basically, if those who have a hard copy are looking to um, page three of the report, and it gives you a summary and an overall comments about how the Six Nations elected council members who participated in the survey, as well as those Six Nations um, council members, administrative leadership members, also felt about the changes that have been made to date. I should say that participation rate was around 50% for both Six Nations elected councillors and the Six Nations um, Council administrative leadership. So it was about half and half. Generally speaking, both the Six Nations Council, elected council and administrative leadership agreed that the process changes to date meaning no committee meetings was positive and could result in long-term benefits. I should note though that generally this position was qualified for half of the Six Nations elected council members who participated. In other words, their position was qualified in that one, they didn't feel there was enough time to, um, to give analysis, proper analysis, and they weren't exactly sure whether this introduction of this new structure would be of benefit, long-term uh, long benefit to this particular council. The other benefits with the process changes and the comfort level with engagement. And what, what I mean by engagement is were participants comfortable now with the amount of contact they had with senior administrative leadership in the reverse, was senior administrative leadership comfortable with the amount of contact that they were having with uh, Six Nations Council members, elected members? Those were two questions that were also asked. Generally, the benefits to the process changes was seen in a positive manner. Generally, the level of engagement between Six Nations elected council and the council administrative leadership was also seen as positive. I also want to note that it was again, half of the Six Nations Council elected members who participated um, felt that there was the challenges with the process changes was um, outweighed those benefits that were, um, that were seen by, by generally both, both of the, all of the participants that, um, that responded. And generally speaking, those Six Nations Ground River elected council participants who did participate in the survey, they talked about two uh, major areas that they felt were problematic or the challenges, and those were disconnect from the community. And the other one was the short time frame for analysis on issues, items, um, that they may not have had enough time to review it. And as I said previously, disconnect from the community about what was happening um, within and information that they received from committee meetings. So those were two main areas of uh, challenges that were identified by uh, half of the Six Nations elected council participants. These areas were not generally identified by the Six Nations um, administrative leadership. They were positive about these changes. There is recognized that there was challenges that need to be addressed. When I did the analysis on the challenges that were identified, you have a couple of the two main areas that I just spoke about, but really these challenges could be addressed by further process changes, meaning reporting templates, as well as ensuring the presence in our increased presence as required of senior administrative leadership at full council meetings. So one of the disconnect was not being able to ask a direct question to senior administrative leadership when they would present at a committee meeting as opposed to how it's set up now. But again, these are challenges that I believe can be addressed with changes in the process as it now stands. I think we have to remember too that this is a preliminary trial period and we knew, and I'm, I'm grateful for the challenge, challenges that were identified by the participants because that gives us an opportunity to close those gaps, 
to fill those um those challenges as as we move forward within the preliminary study period. At the same time, it does take a bit of time to be able to make changes that are necessary to close gaps, identified gaps. It, it doesn't happen overnight, um, given the size of the organization and the fact that you now have uh, governance trying to add another piece in working with the administrative um, body of Six Nations Council. So those are those are <clears throat> two areas that were identified. The other area that, generally speaking, people were comfortable with the level of engagement that they had with uh, Six Nations elected council by senior administrative leadership and Six Nations councillors were half who participated in this survey were comfortable with the level of engagement. One of the biggest challenges at this uh, at this level of comfortability is because there's been such, um, for lack of a better word, a bit, a, a bit quick movement on how that would flow out. It is recognized that in order to flow more smoothly, we need to have senior leadership uh, administratively, the administrative leadership at more full council table meetings to be able to answer questions, to state various positions on an administrative level so that Six Nations, Six Nations Council elected members can have clearer pictures about what they're dealing with. So I don't think these challenges are insurmountable. I believe that there has to be several shifts in the way that mm, we're unfolding as it is now. But again, those will take time. So that's in the nutshell the um, outcomes of the surveys that were presented. I should back up one more piece. The initial communication that went out to the community, letting the community know that there would be this trial preliminary period that Six Nations elected council was engaging in. Um, there's a second piece to the communications plan that we are now entering. This information in this report is presented to council as information. There is a recommendation associated with that. Further to the communications to the community, we will be entering the second phase. And that is once this is approved as information, this information has will go out to the community at large to let them know the results of the first half of the preliminary period. That has already proved on that has already been approved by this council under the communications plan um, that was approved by resolution previous to this. So just to let you know, communication will still be ongoing with the community at large about how this uh, preliminary study period is unfolding, but there is one recommendation and that recommendation, given that this council has requested that the senior leadership administration, the administration's senior leadership be consulted on this uh, potential changes and um, the short time frame for the preliminary study period, it's recommended that the preliminary study period be extended. So we can get a, first of all, we can get a clearer lock on whether this is going to be most effective for this Six Nations Council and also uh, give us an opportunity to close some of those gaps or challenges that have been identified from the results of this survey. So I'm not sure, Chief, how you wanna proceed with this or if there's any questions, maybe I should ask that first. Excuse me. Okay, thank you, uh, Niawa Jill, for providing us uh, with this uh, update and report. Uh, I do uh, just really quickly again, uh, I'm glad that you touched obviously uh, on the challenges even within uh, the uh, the survey. I know that was one of my uh, you know concerns as well as you know having that connection more, uh, you know so that council doesn't feel I mean as much as we can say administration divide, I mean, uh, you know trying to separate uh, staying out of administration and, and, and staying in governance lane. Uh, you know, and really looking to our political advocacy pieces needed across the board for the different sectors of each department. Uh, you know, I was glad to hear that some felt the same uh, in that we could still have our directors in that full council meetings, 
uh, you know, to provide any updates that's happening within departments, especially when it comes to our larger departments like health, for example, and all the changes uh, politically happening uh, under health. So that, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you've highlighted th those pieces. I think it's important to also note uh, that uh, we knew in the beginning, I mean, as much as we wanted to uh, get to this work, uh, you know, as, as quickly as we, we could, it's not, I think it's important to note that it's not just, I think, going to be beneficial to this sitting council as the 58th, but the longevity of the of the process in the uh, in the work really uh, of you know of the future councils, and I think that's something that's really important to note of efficiencies when you know certain um, items come to the table and need that political work, uh, and when you know councillors do have uh, you know a certain passion or, or interest or you know expertise in a in a file. Uh, and be able to bring those forward to the table, you know, in a, in a timely manner, as opposed to, you know, jumping through multiple hoops through committees and so forth. So I am still very much appreciative of the work, uh, Jill. I think it's important to, for this council maybe to uh, maybe have a conversation around the extension, uh, because I think it'd be, it'd be valuable in extending uh, the time frame of this preliminary study, uh, but also to acknowledge uh, Councillor Nathan's uh, comments in the chat as well in relation to uh, his comments of saying uh, he, that he agrees with the report uh, and feels that we are in a position to address the identified challenges uh, with the necessary tools to support us. So again, you know, it's really having, I agree with Nathan as well, I think it's really making sure that we do have, um, you know, the, the not just the, the, you know, the human capital of support and tools, uh, having the necessary people supporting council. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the I know with the meeting templates, Jill, uh, that I think those are also really helpful uh, with counselors uh, when uh, attending uh, a conference or so forth uh, and coming back with that report to full council. So uh, those are just my opening comments. I think it's it's I think we're on a good track. I'm glad to see that the challenges were highlighted and I'm glad to see that we can make the necessary pivots uh, in this preliminary study to, again, best address deficiencies across the board. Uh, so I'll I'll look to maybe pause and see if there's any further questions, comments on Jill's uh, update, uh, and then maybe perhaps we can have a conversation around the extension, uh, the possible extension. Oh, sorry, uh, Melba, you're not on mute. Go ahead, Melba. Melba. Uh, Mark, uh, you made a comment that uh, directors can still come and present. Now, how is that going to be different than committees? Well, I think first off, the main difference is that uh, it's going to be in front of full council. It's, it's not going to be just committee members that will be privy to certain information. I think it's going to be have opportunity for full council to have uh, that opportunity to ask direct questions and to be able to help to lay out a political advocacy plan with our director, as opposed to just three committee members. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mark, yeah. Mark, yeah, we don't always uh, deal with political plans. When they present, they actually present what they're doing for the community by way of their programs and various services. So I'm not understanding here and I'm questioning how things are going to be different because we've always did political advocacy when it was needed, right. along with uh, uh, committees connection. Right. So I and just, how uh, is all of this different right now? Yeah. So and maybe perhaps I can even look. I know Jill has her hand raised. Maybe she could shed some further light on on Melba your questions. I think even just regard just really quickly, Melba. I think this is a positive thing for us in terms of having that connection overall to what you're saying uh, when it comes to community uh, and updating community what's happening within departments and so forth. Uh, Jill, did you? Further add? Yes, thank you, Chief. Um, two points I want to highlight. One is the changes to the templates, the templates that are currently, currently being utilized for updates to council and having those updates and templates being sent to full council and the ability of directors to answer questions related to those update templates. So we there is a bit of work to do on the administrative side to streamline this a little bit more. So you're getting 
similar information to what you're getting before to help with the connection or disconnection or perceived disconnection that this structure may, may result in. The second thing I want to make sure that is highlighted is the senior administrative leadership were in full support of, um, or fully supportive, not full support, but generally speaking, they had very high support for the updates and how they were being provided at this time. It does need a bit of tweets because from the administrative side, they also identified wanting to be able to ask questions directly or wanting to be able to respond to questions. I believe that with changes not only in the templates, but also having directors attend some of the full council meetings, we are able to close those gaps and address those challenges which are identified. I, I agree and thanks, thanks for that, Jill. I think that's an important piece to highlight in relation to those templates and the streamline of information. So I hope that does help answer your question, Melba. At this point, I'll go over to Nathan. On this particular piece, because when committees historically have presented to full council and issues have come from committee to full council, it's only those um, council members that are on that particular committee that have the depth of knowledge. And, and I'll be honest, um, you know, uh, on human resources uh, consistently, you can tell there's more counselors with knowledge because of the committee structure. But when it comes to council, we don't get that full context. And I, I think it's a disservice and it's unfair that we don't have the, the full information or that opportunity that that particular committee had to go back and forth uh, with the senior um, administrative folks. But then when it gets to full council, those senior administrative folks aren't available. And there's we're left with a lot of uh, I don't knows and uh, I'll have to get back to you. So I think we would save ourselves a lot of time if we just um, kind of continue um, feeding this information to full council. That way we get the full breadth of both uh, the update. And then from there, we can help identify what those political issues are a lot better. Um, so streamlining it is, is gonna kind of help out. And I think it's gonna give us more access is, is what I'm hearing from Jill uh, to uh, the subject matter experts so we can get our answers, questions answered. So. I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm fully supportive of, of this. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for your comments as well. Uh, I, I have uh, Michelle next. Okay. Okay. Um, so I will move the motion. I think we need a little longer, as Jill has, has said. Um, and I would actually suggest that we maybe do a focus group with the entire full council, because I know only half of us responded. And so, you know, if that can be a possibility, Jill, I know you made some mention to doing three different kinds of outreach for the council, um, that would be ideal. So I'll move it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Michelle. So there is a motion and a resolution on the floor uh, to extend uh, our extend our uh, preliminary study period of the Gajuka structure. Uh, just to confirm, Michelle, are you looking to uh, or wanted to maybe confirm with Jill if another uh, eight weeks is suitable for the extension and how you see that? I just wanted to weigh in, Jill, on that just in terms of the extension time frame. So Jill, if you could help on that piece, and Michelle, and your the recommendation so it's December sixteenth. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I didn't have that in front of me. Thanks for that, Michelle. So there's moved by Michelle. It's seconded. Is there a seconder rather? Looking to a seconder. I'll second that, Chief. Okay, seconded by Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. And I'll now go back to further questions, comments. Uh, Sherry Lynn. Um, go ahead, Melba. Melba can go, Chief. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, just a bit further. I'd like to know how 
how the committees, how the how the departments are functioning without reporting to committees. As you mentioned, I'll go back. Oh, we can have directors report to council. How are they functioning right now? Because I think they're struggling. That's what I think. They look for approvals at different areas, for example. They give us information what is happening. And a lot of times we have questions directly to them about their programs. How are they functioning with this new um, way of, uh, I guess, uh, connecting to one another? I'd like to see some information from all the committees, all the departments of how they feel and how, what they are, what they are, I guess, struggling with possibly in how it was previous. I'd like to see that because I think there's, there's um, uh, real, as I said, chaos and confusion. I think there is, but I wish, I wish there isn't. I hopefully this is smooth. But I'd like to hear about that from all the departments. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Melba. I'll look to, just before I go to further questions and comments, I'll look to uh, Jill and perhaps maybe if Darren has any uh, comments he'd like to share on that. Jill? Thank you, Chief. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand um, the, the uh, question that Melba has brought forward. When I did the, the survey, it the question was asked whether they felt it was uh, working in the three and a half period that we had. I didn't ask them what, um, well, I did ask them challenges actually. I did ask them challenges and they did identify some challenges, which I mentioned a few of them in a, in a broad way. But certainly with the extension of the preliminary trial period, I think that will give us, Melba, an opportunity to ask the very question that you are, you are asking. Without the committees, how are they functioning administratively? I mean, that, that's a fair question to ask. And I think with the extension, we'll be able to see that. And, and given a little bit more time, we'll be able to see whether this is something that is going to be positive for them as well. At the front end, they have identified it as something being very positive for them, but the reverse question hasn't been asked with the exception of the challenges. So certainly I think with the extension of this, that will give us an opportunity to ask the very question um, which you stated, Melba. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jill, for, for providing us uh, with Thank your you. comments. Uh, I want to just really quickly want to go to Darren to see if he wants to add anything further on this. Uh, uh, thanks for the questions. And um, I, I guess a couple of things. Um, I've been kind of waiting to, to speak to this, but thanks, Jill, for the, for the study uh, and the report, because I think it really gives us a, a good sense that, you know, it does need a bit more time. I think that's one of the things we went into this as a study period, went into, went into, into it as a, let's see how we go and what, what adjustments and refinements can we make? And I think it was, it served us well in that regard. And just to kind of give you a bit more insight, Mel, but I completely appreciate where you're coming from. And I put your mind at ease to, to some extent, I have not witnessed any sort of chaos, as you say, a lot of it is more to do with staff challenges and sickness. We still have a lot of sickness um, and some turnover. So I think that those are the challenges that we've we faced and we continue to face. Um, but we talked a little bit about it at the SAT meeting uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was no sort of negativity. I think I can support some of the findings that Jill has reported on. Uh, they welcome the change. I think one area, and I agree that there, there is a need to, to work out the kinks on the process to have more connection with counselors and the senior team. And when we were, we were looking at the structure early in the early days, we had thought about having, I'll call them informal teams or ability to reach out, counselors to reach out directly to directors on specific issues or specific areas of advocacy that's required. Um, you know, and the reports are still gonna be provided as, as they have been, but this would be allow, allow a little bit more engagement. And I think that's where the, the one area where I see the directors are still struggling is really kind of, prioritizing the areas for advocacy that they see from their from their view uh, and sharing that with council. 
So if, if anything, I think that's a challenge that I've noticed. That is provided for in the template, but I would say half of the time they say there's no efficacy needed when once they really, really dug into it, they realize that there is certainly some efficacy that's required. So I think they're sort of stuck in the old way of, I wanna do a report to council, here's everything we're doing, here's our challenges with HR, and they're not focusing enough on, here's when we need to hand it over to council to us, help us with this. And here's the data to support that advocacy. So I think we're in that space right now, which is a good place to be. It's better than where we were before, in, in my opinion, but I agree uh, with, the, with the extension. Uh, I kind of alluded to the fact that that's probably what's gonna happen. And the, and the directors were very happy with that sort of approach. So uh, we're working through it. I think it's, it's, it's an improving uh, process improvement piece. So I can, I'll say that for now, Chief, I could say more, but uh, those are some observations that I have for everyone. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Darren. And just to really quickly also add before I go back to Melba um, is, you know, I think, you know, Melba, there's a, there's the other port, important piece to highlight is we knew uh, that there was going to be, uh, you know, kinks that needed to be ironed out, right? So I wasn't going into this structure thinking that it was going to be picture perfect uh, and looking to the highlighted, you know, challenges in which uh, Jill and Darren have just alluded to. So I think it's just even further uh, looking to even your point of, uh, making sure that uh, you know that everybody feels comfortable and we're uh, you know we're heading in which direction. Uh, but I think I do agree with Darren in terms of the in Jill with the extension, uh, so that we can further see and analysis uh, do the analysis on just your question that you posed, Melba. Okay, I have one further comment. Uh, it was mentioned in the half in the past that we would have support. Now. Where is our clerical support when we need it? And where is our office space? Because right now, uh, on a couple of occasions, we've used the chambers. Is that gonna continue to be our offices? And also restaurants, we, we use that also. How is that going to be corrected? So that's a, that's a really good question uh, in relation to the office space. As you're well aware, uh, everybody uh, needs an office. Uh, and we're doing our best to, uh, you know, to make uh, more room. Um, so that I think is something that we need to discuss further amongst ourselves in relation to, uh, you know, how we could get even, uh, you know, a couple offices somewhere located, uh, maybe even within the plaza. I don't know if there's a, an opportunity. I think there was at, at some point, uh, um, you know, space within the plaza. Uh, so that, uh, you know, again, it, it's, um, it's right in the downtown of Schwiegen. I think it would be easier to meet constituents and members of our community. So that's something I think that we can uh, further explore, Melba, on the office space side uh, in relation to the further supports. I'm gonna look to uh, Jill to further assist in, in, in responding to that. Jill? Thank you, Chief. I just wanted to mention that as we move uh, further into the preliminary study period, we'll be able to address some of those challenges Melba, that you identified. We recognize that we have yet to do that work to offer the full support to the Six Nations uh, Grand River elected councillors, as well as the space that's needed for them to do their work. We recognize that. This first piece was simply um, trying to move from a committee structure to a full council structure. That's why it's so important that we extend the preliminary trial period so that we can do the next steps and these, these other important steps that are critical for the counselors to do their work. So we are cognizant of that. It was just a matter of you know having the time and the ability to sit down and figure out solutions to the challenges that you raised because they certainly are um, real challenges. Office space is a challenge for everyone, everywhere across the board. And how are we going to put together the supports for you as counselors to do your work? We have yet to add the piece about the Gunjukwa structure in terms of assignments to each counselor and what they will be involved in. So that piece has not been in, initiated yet and we have yet to do that work. So the work is ongoing. We're cognizant of that, we're aware of that. And hopefully the extension of the preliminary trial period will give us an opportunity to do more of that work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jill uh, and Melba. I hope that does, uh, that does help suffice uh, yourself in some of your comments and questions. 
So uh, again, much work to continue, but I think, you know, I wouldn't mind even seeing in the interim as well, looking to still explore if there's space within the plaza. I think it's given that it's, uh, you know, it's right there within the, in the, within the downtown core, you know, easy access to community members. So uh, maybe perhaps Melba, we could further discuss that within full council uh, and see if that's an opportunity uh, in the interim as we uh, continue to move forward in the next steps with Kanjukwa. Uh, I'm going to go down the next uh, two hands raised. I have Hazel uh, in queue next. Okay. Um, 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 okay just hold on. Yeah, no problem. Um, there's a few areas that I want to uh, mention. First of all, I think it's the best decision to have an extension period to this because at the onset, I did not feel that that time frame that was allotted for this first um, uh, period was long enough. Um, I think it's better that it's extended and it gives you more time to evaluate and see what's happening. So that leads me into the experience that I have with regard to the call from Rexall Drugstore in Caledonia. Um, that information that all came out of that was literally news to everybody. And um, I didn't fill out any um, forms. I just sent an email because to me, for that drugstore to even seek me out and, and ask me those questions because they could not get in touch with anyone. And if you really think about a person's prescription, that's their life and death. Uh, paper. If people's prescriptions cannot be renewed, somebody needs to act pretty fast. Now, the problem being of replacing that Dr. Tyler Tababanon, that's now two months old. And what did we learn from me sending out that email other than the fact of all the things that health have been doing, but it still didn't address any problem in terms of getting those prescriptions filled. I think that was kind of like a blessing in disguise of um, shedding some light on where we could, you know, some things that we need to know. So I've, I've thought long and hard about, cause I'm always thinking to help fix something rather than, um, you know, if you have concerns about something, well, let's attempt to fix it. So I was gonna suggest that the senior management team would meet with council in a monthly meeting that would give you the chance to converse with them, to see things that are, um, uh, that need discussion and have the ability and the time to ask those questions and that they could answer them. Um, what else was I gonna say? I think the one thing too from that Rexall drugstore phone call was the fact that they said they've been calling and calling and nobody answers. And this this really bothers me that more employees are at home than they are at work. It And I said that in my email that it feels like nobody cares. That's the impression that it gives me. When you're phoning around, when you have an issue that's important and needs addressing immediately, and you phone and there's no answer. And if you ask the question, where are they? Well, they're at home. That's not good. I don't care how anybody takes this. I think everybody needs to get back to their workstation and be on site every day, just like normal employees have to do in any setting. So with the lack of um, space for offices, you know, we all know that there's not much space. However, we did hear from ECDEV who wanted to return OBP to council. So there's a lot of office space down there. They have a lot of people renting down there. All of those offices could be taken over by all the offices here who don't have an actual or enough room to operate. But please let's get the employees back to work where they should be and have somebody answering those phones because 
when somebody's looking to get a prescription refilled and there's nobody answering anywhere, that's a problem. So that's my say for this morning. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Hazel. Uh, you've touched on on many uh, different topics, and I think uh, again, it's it's still uh, it's good suggestions, and I can think, uh, you know, looking at uh, you know how we can further explore uh, some of your suggestions. Um, you know, we'll definitely look to uh, highlight those pieces. Uh, the the next uh, again, just really quickly, when we talk about the Gundrupa structure itself, uh, you know, I, I the the end goal is, and I do like your suggestion as well, uh, Hazel, in relation to SAT and full council monthly. Uh, maybe that's an opportunity, or maybe there's another way. I know this is something that Darren's even touched on in relation to those, uh, you know, the the groups. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we we want to be able to make sure uh, that you know people are at their spots where they should be, that phones are being answered, that people are getting followed up. You know, those are I think uh, important pieces. Uh, and I know uh, just that with that one particular situation definitely highlights you know just some of the challenges that we need to be able to uh, fill you know fix those challenges or fix the gaps. Uh, and I think that's something that um, again we can do. Uh, in the next uh, in the next steps here within the Gunjukwa structure, uh, Sherry Lins and Q next. Uh, Helen, go ahead. Helen. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Helen. Sorry, Helen, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I agree with Nathan that the committee structure wasn't working, but I also agree that it would have been much simpler to ensure that the committee structure was working. The committee structure, according to the, the way the committee structure is supposed to work, the chairperson isn't just sitting there to take care of meetings. The chairperson was supposed to be coming to council and updating council on all of the political issues or any of the challenges, et cetera, that the department was going through. But that's the part that never happened, Not at least not in the years I've been sitting there. The chairperson of the committee has never ever reported to council on much of anything. Maybe he might mention a few things, but they never really did a whole fulsome report to council on the committee meeting. And that's where the breakdown of the committee was. I agree with committees in that sense, because to me, my issue is disconnect to the community. Community people had opportunity to come to committee to do their presentations to raise their concerns, to raise their issues. Um, and then that, to me, that's what's, that's what's lost from what we're doing now. Where are the people gonna go? To, if somebody has, you know, where are they gonna go to raise their concern to a counselor? They wanna do it to counsel. They don't wanna do it to somebody sitting in an office that a third party person sitting in the office that's going to take their, their concern and go someplace else with it. They want to do it to council. And that's what always made our council unique was because that real connection we had with people. And I see this whole process disconnecting from the people. And that's the biggest concern I have with it because that, they're the ones that elected us. That's who we're supposed to be working for. Um, and I just, I agree. Like I said, I agree the committees weren't working the way they were supposed to, but I think it would have been a lot easier just to fix the committee instead of going through this whole process that we're going through to change everything. But that's my concern. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen, for highlighting uh, some of your concerns. I think just really quickly uh, in response, and, I, and this is the important piece of the process of, you know, having this dialogue and, and highlighting all of our concerns to try to, to Hazel's point, attempt to fix it. And I think that's something, you know, right now, uh, community uh, still has that opportunity. It's not like that has been lost because they still have, we have two general councils a month which give opportunity for community to come and present in, on any uh, initiative or project or whatever that may be. And still as well, uh, community has always had an opportunity uh, to call and pick up the phone or meet with their counselors. I think the only piece of, of where we need to do further 
uh, communication is uh, with the new position of Joe Martin. You know, we already know that he that was that was not to replace counselors. That was not to ever look to replace community of going to counselors. Uh, you know, where that was again looking to have a further solution on follow up, uh, and so that he could assist on the administrative side with anything uh, that the community member may need further follow up with. Again, I, that not is not it's to amplify support for our counselors to do the work, the necessary work on the administrative side. It's not to take away uh, from counselors. That is never that was never the intent. So. I think that's something that we need to do further work on, but again, do uh, do hear you loud and clear. And I think it's something that again, uh, future councils will be able to further benefit from when it taught when we when we could, you know, the other difficulty I think that we had with the committee structures, it was it was there was no opportunity for political advocacy strategies. I mean, as much as we wanted to say there was, uh, that wasn't happening either. And so I think this really gives opportunity to focus in on those political advocacy pieces. So I think regardless of which, I, again, I don't want to uh, sound as if I'm rebuttaling, but it's just a matter of, you know, where and how can we further look at the solutions and attempt to fix of what your concerns are. Um, Sherry Lou? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Um, I agree with what Michelle said, because I don't think there was enough um, input. If you only have 44.4 for um, council, and then you have only have 46% for the SAT team. I think more input needs to be put into this and not just um, the short, um, not the people who did. I think there needs to be more. I agree with Helen. I totally agree that there is disconnect with the community. And I totally agree we work with, we work for the people because the perceptions and the things that I'm getting is that, um, can I even talk, can I talk to you now? Or do I have to go to that guy now? Who meaning Joe. So it's the perception that's out there in the community that um, they're not able, <laughs> the community can't come to us. They have to go to, the, go to Joe. So I think that's a, um, a thing that we need to, to clear in the community because I still tell them you can come see me because that's my job. So I think there's a fine line and I totally, under, I totally agree, you know, admin and um, governance, but it's the people. Where's that fine line? So the people still feel that they're being heard, that they still feel that they don't have to jump so through so many hoops and hopefully get on this agenda or get a call back. All these kinds of things that are falling through the cracks that I've been encountering that um, shouldn't be happening. And the other part, I think also too, if they were doing political and the issues, I think we need to get the SAT team or the directors with the issues politically to start coming to the forefront because we see all these issues that are coming in our community the homelessness, the housing, the drugs. Um, where's the? We need to start doing these solutions to start lobbying for them. So I guess that's where I'm at with this. And again, for the family health team, I think that needs a whole nother um, discussion where they're going to re report to. So I think this is, <laughs> there's a lot of pieces to this. So um, I just wanted to share that part that, uh, I kind of I agree with what people are saying, but I still see that strong um, disconnect. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sherilyn, for sharing your concerns as well. Uh, and I think you know, just to highlight the the uh, back to Michelle's suggestion uh, of having uh, a focus group. So maybe Jill, uh, we can look to explore uh, you know a full council focus group on this uh, on this specific matter itself. I think that's a good good suggestion to to uh, to uh, look to, and I think uh, as well uh, just to highlight uh, as uh, for Sherilyn's uh, point, uh, you know the clarity piece to community because you know we all of us are still accessible. In in Helen's right, we do work for the people, uh, and so we need to make sure that the connection is always there and that our availability and access is always there, and that's something again that was never the intent of this conjunctive structure. This, the intent was always looking at efficiencies and always trying to look at streamlining and making sure 
uh, that information was getting to the table and that plans or strategies were being you know, worked out. Uh, so again, uh, there is uh, many more items as noted uh, that we need to focus on and filling the gaps and challenges. And I think just with the resolution that's on the floor uh, with the extension is just gonna give us that time to further uh, look to, uh, to, to again, Hazel's points uh, attempting to fix it. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, uh, I guess my only words would be to have uh, to full counsel is to have patience as we move through this process and what it looks like. Uh, because I think uh, it's easy to knock something down quickly when there's a number of concerns. But I think once we start to iron out things and start to look at fixing and what, uh, you know, what we can be, what can be addressed is when we'll start to see the, the, the true in full benefit of what the structure and the intentions were behind this work. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, thanks, Chief. Um, just wanted to also continue this dialogue and pick up on something uh, that was mentioned around um, the, the committee structure and the chairs not necessarily bringing political issues forward. And, and that's um, one of the things I was thinking of in terms of the, the tools we need and maybe even some training. Uh, because I think that issue is still going to exist if we're in portfolios um, in, in terms of um, doing that particular work. And I'm, I'm actually going through that exercise uh, this coming week uh, because environment is becoming pretty administrative. And, and uh, I'm going to spend some time at our committee meetings to identify exactly what those political issues are so I can bring them to council. Um, so just kind of that real example of um, uh, having those pieces uh, come forward, because I think for me, that was the biggest thing. Uh, I think it was Helen who mentioned that uh, uh, committees um, didn't necessarily, or the chairs didn't necessarily bring forward what those political issues were uh, in, in terms of those synopsis. Um, and, and I think that has to, we have to overcome that. Um, and, and my, I'm only speaking in, in the experience that I've worked here, which is only one term in the last three years. Um, I, I, I just think we need to further support um, and, and provide tools to bring those political issues forward uh, as portfolios. Because if we don't do anything, I think uh, we're gonna run into those same issues that Helen raised around um, the portfolios not bringing them forward. The other thing too, is there is that flip side. Uh, there are those in the community that do agree with this, and I've heard from at least two of them, uh, you know, with the uh, comments that, you know, it's about time. Uh, and um, uh, they, they have been watching the, the kind of work around, um, you know, bringing concerns forward because that's the biggest issue for them is they can bring a forward a concern to a counselor, but it takes so long to get addressed because it has to go through so many steps. And, and if we're going to get quicker in that response, because uh, I don't, I'm still getting phone calls, um, they're not going to Joe yet. Um, so uh, I, I think as we look to kind of address the gaps, I think we need to really look at that kind of process uh, around complaints uh, that we tighten that up. And, and I think that's something we should look to perfect first as a priority. Um, only because that's where the credence comes in. That's where the credibility for this particular process comes into play is the ability for that to actually resolve the concerns. Um, so it's my hope that, you know, as we go forward and, and we see these challenges that everyone's raising, that we have that response for it and, and those tools for it to come to address those. Um, so just leave them there for now yeah i think uh thanks nathan i think uh, your comments uh, definitely good good points uh, on those pieces and uh you know in fact it was we've always kind of referenced uh you know the task force the environment task force as kind of a and uh, I, I would say for lack of a better term uh, kind of our guinea pig in this process of you know we're, you, we've already been doing this work the environment task force has already been doing this kind of style of process uh, and you can attest to it yourself as the as the lead there. So I think it's important to also, uh, you know, highlight, uh, you know, what exactly you're saying in terms of, you know, we don't want to set up something that's uh, that's going to in the long run do the same thing uh, or run into the same challenges 
Um, but I think that I'm glad you mentioned the flip side of things too, because I've also heard those same comments as well as uh, in terms of the structure, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how can we, uh, and, and here's the thing, I think we always get caught up on, you know, concerns or complaints, which I know a lot of the times is our jobs to fix, but there are also members in our community who want to bring forward ideas and suggestions and potential solutions. And I think that's something that we also uh, need to give opportunity to. And I'm hopeful that with even within, uh, you know, Joel's role that we're also going to hear some, you know, potential ideas and suggestions to fixing things, not necessarily always having to come from solution base from the table. So I think there's 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 real opportunity uh, in change. And I, again, I want to highlight the fact that, you know, change is never easy. Uh, and change is, in fact, always scary. But I think if we take the necessary time in which again, the motion on the table is doing so that we can be able to do this properly. We are able to address the concerns, you know, um, you know, properly again, and look at this in a way of, uh, you know, optimism and, and really looking to see uh, that this is for efficiencies and what it looks like. So uh, not eliminating the fact of concerns, but rather fixing those and how we are attempt to fix them and what, it, what that looks like. So do appreciate your comments, Nathan, as well. Uh, Melba. Go ahead, Mama. Yes, Mark. Yeah, I don't hear too much about the elderly in respect of what they're doing. Like, how do we hear their voice even more? Because as you're, you're aware that the tenants uh, had a meeting recently, which they expressed a lot of, a lot of needs and around safety and other things that they need and what they experience around safety within the units. And I'm wondering how um, what we're doing right now is going to improve, because as we know, transportation is a problem. They can't just come up. Jan is here in the audience, uh, one of our elders. She's able to do some of those things, but other elders are not able to do that. So they need a voice. And as I do that report, Hazel and I, you will be hearing that they need a voice on a monthly basis where they can uh, express their needs and solutions can be worked on concerning um, all the needs of the elders. So I would like that to be part of the ongoing information that uh, solutions can be arrived at concerning information flow, for example. They don't have the technology, for example, right now of live streaming, many of them don't. How can we improve that where we uh, connect with, with our elders even more concerning our new way of, uh, of doing our political work? Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point as well, um, uh, Melba. Thanks for bringing that forward. I think it's important. And, and I, obviously, Jill uh, making notes on her end as well to some of these pieces. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do at the at the you know the as part of this whole work is really amplifying voices within community and giving opportunity across the board so you know for our, our elders and and and, and um, seniors and so forth because we know that there's different challenges and we know that there's different um, you know things that that they are going through than say a young person uh, you know would be going through so I think it's really looking at those uh, you know those voices like you say Melba uh, and really making sure that they have that space. So we'll definitely, uh, I'm definitely making note of that, uh, and we'll uh, include that in our next uh, next steps here within this this process that we're undertaking. So I don't see. Uh, do you appreciate that you bring forward, uh, Melba? I don't see any further uh, questions or or concerns or hands being raised. So I will go back to the motion at this point. It's been moved and seconded for the recommended uh, time frame of the extension of the Gajukwa structure. Uh, I will now look to a vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. Uh, Looking to a mover and seconder to waive second reading. Um, oh, I'll second. 
It's moved by Michelle and seconded by Kerry to waive second reading. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Chief. Oh, sorry, Michelle? Jan would like to say something in regards to the topic we just discussed. Sure. Can she borrow your screen? Would you just talk in here? Yep. Uh, good morning, Mark. Good morning, it's Jan. Jan Longboat here. And I've, I've been invited here this morning to, uh, as a community member and an elder, to listen to a Zoom meeting, because I don't know how to do that uh, on uh, land. So I guess it's on your agenda, and that's why I'm here this morning. But uh, I just got here a little early, so I did hear a few things. And I totally agree with what the people are saying. That is that you need to get back to work. <laughs> you know, people don't know what's going on. And, and I get 10, 10 calls a day and do I know what's happening uh, in the community? And I do. In fact, I went to a meeting on land yesterday. And uh, so I, I really believe you need some sort of a community member to, um, to attend some of your meetings to keep you posted on what's going on at our level, you know, and in the community. Uh, so I think it's good. And I'm really looking forward to the Zoom meeting today. Nyawa, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Okay, Nyawa, uh, thank you, uh, Jane. It's, uh, it's nice to see you and, and do agree. And I, uh, we do have a long agenda. So this is just the first, uh, the first delegation and topic uh, but do uh, do agree, and and we'll look to further engage uh, with you uh, in uh, in the future uh, future discussions here on the agenda. Uh, okay, I will then now look to our. I'm going back to our agenda here, uh, which is our next delegation. Uh, I believe Heather Watts uh, is online from the lifelong, excuse me, the lifelong learning task force. Uh, which is an overall update uh, to the work uh, and next steps. So with that being said, uh, good morning, uh, Heather. I'll pass the floor uh, right over to yourself. Great, uh, Nyawa, thank you and good morning, uh, Chief Hill uh, Council, as well as the community. Um, happy to be here uh, alongside uh, some of our staff. Uh, we've got Lindsay Hill here today, who's our uh, administrative coordinator, uh, Clinton Pallas, who's our financial analyst, as well as Michael Hill, who's our policy analyst. We also have two of our uh, core team participants who are on the line. So Nyawa to uh, Karen Sandy, uh, as well as Phil Montour for, uh, for being here today. And um, yeah, we just have a high level update. Uh, it may look very kind of similar to uh, the last time we were able to present in this way uh, via uh, Zoom and Facebook Live. And so we'll be presenting you uh, with some new information and, and Council, you'll notice that we're not going to hit on uh, every single one of those 45 slides as uh, we know we have limited time here today, um, but really the, the new information coming from the update. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started and share screen and, and uh, get us going here. Okay. Okay, so just again, um, for anyone tuning in from the community who this is their first time uh, kind of listening or interacting with the work of the Lifelong Learning Task Force, just wanted to put the mandate here up on the screen that uh, back in 2018, this task force was mandated to explore options and make recommendations on a world-class lifelong learning education system uh, grounded in language and culture uh, for the, the Six Nations of the Grand River community. So something I always like to state and our team always likes to state is that we are in the business of knowledge gathering and knowledge sharing. Uh, so doing research in terms of what is going on in sister communities, doing research in terms of what is kind of known as best practice uh, in the world of education, as well as what are we hearing from community members in terms of what our wants uh, and needs are, what gaps uh, exist, as well as what are some really great frameworks that are already in operation in many of the learning environments across the community uh, that have already been established. Okay. 
Just wanted to make a connection here to the work of the community plan coming out of 2019, that education as well as employment um, are two uh, specific points within this community plan. Um, and that the goal uh, that was stated in this community plan was to develop a community-based holistic lifelong learning education approach. And so that is where our work comes in, uh, in terms of putting forward recommendations on what that approach uh, might look like across a number of different buckets. Here we're talking about what does education infrastructure look like, capital for education, transportation system for education, what a learning environment might look like, what the governance of such a system might look like. Okay. We have kind of three different uh, entities that work together uh, to, to uh, make the work of the Lifelong Learning Task Force move forward. Uh, the actual larger task force meets quarterly and uh, is roughly around 30, uh, 30 participants uh, who come and you know, make their voices uh, heard and, and direct the work of the Lifelong Learning Task Force in terms of research. Uh, we then have the we have the core team uh, that almost kind of acts as as our governance for this entire framework. Uh, it's, right now, it's a ten person core team uh, that oversees uh, the work of the broader task force as well as the education coordination office, which kind of acts as as more of the administrative uh, component. Uh, so that includes uh, myself as well as uh, the the three team members who I uh, acknowledged and mentioned at the very beginning. And so just going to, I'm not going to read word for word here, but uh, again, just to kind of provide high level uh, in terms of the different responsibilities and, and roles as it relates to uh, the task force, right? as well as the core team. So the core team meets much more uh, frequently, uh, typically uh, twice a month. Uh, the core team has uh, meetings and approves uh, all of the work plans, proposals, et cetera, that may be put forward uh, by the education coordination office. Okay, so this graphic may look uh, familiar. Uh, we did present it last time in terms of this is our information kind of processing cycle. Uh, one, to gather information there in the yellow. Uh, two, share information there in the green. Uh, three, obtain input in the purple. And uh, in brown, uh, four, to rec make recommendations or draft recommendations. Now, happy to, to report that all of our studies um, have been completed. So um, all of these studies, uh, were, were contracts uh, that went out to uh, consultants, mostly uh, community-based consultants, which uh, we were really proud of that a lot of that work was able to stay within the community. And so we have final reports on all of these topics. Um, we have provided either an executive summary or a one pager to council um, on all of these topics. Um, most recently, uh, transportation as well as capital and infrastructure, uh, which I'll get into in just a moment. Um, all of uh, the studies, except for those two that I just mentioned, transportation and capital and infrastructure, are available uh, online on our website, uh, snlifelonglearning.ca, uh, so anyone from the community is able to access those and download and uh, take, a, take a read if, uh, if you so choose uh, to do so. Um, okay, so looking here at transportation, so those other studies kind of that I just uh, went over here, um, back on this slide, everything before transportation, we presented on at our last update, so I'm just going to present on the, the final three, uh, which last time uh, were still in uh, the, the completion stage, so they were not completed just yet, okay. So our transportation study uh, was completed by First Nations Engineering Services and uh, a really uh, incredible uh, study actually looking at transportation uh, for education specifically. So I know there is work going on in other spaces in terms of a transportation you know, planning group. And we have, have been very transparent in sharing this report uh, with that group, as well as uh, sharing it with the, the chief's office and the one pager that we provided to you council. Um, I think back in July, we provided the, the one pager. So very holistic uh, study in terms of looking at 
what education uh, transportation could look like if Six Nations were to assume that responsibility uh, for education transportation. Uh, during this study, we did connect with principals, we connected with, uh, with parents and guardians, uh, as well as uh, there were a couple teachers uh, who, who came into the engagement, uh, as well as folks within council. So um, uh, Director Michael Montour was, was involved in some of these conversations as, as well when it came to uh, education education transportation. Capital and infrastructure, uh, so uh, also completed by Finesle, First Nations Engineering Services, uh, back in April. And, uh, and again, so this study is, is complete. And uh, it's, it's a very robust study, uh, which actually looks at a 20 year planning period moving forward in terms of the, the various schools um, and uh, projected uh, new buildings that would need to uh, that would need to be constructed uh, to support the work of uh, an education coordination unit uh, in the community going forward. Uh, so back in July, we also presented uh, a one pager, I guess it wasn't presented, we turned in a one pager um, to council during our July political uh, liaison report. And this report has also been shared with the uh, infrastructure uh, task force as well. And we are working to coordinate with the two engineers uh, who were at the head of the study uh, to actually make a formal presentation into the infrastructure Structure task force to be able to provide uh, more context as this is like, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, close to a, a 300 page uh, report. And so to be able to provide those really salient um, points uh, moving forward, uh, that's what we're currently uh, working on trying to connect the, the uh, infrastructure task force and Finesle to be able to uh, have, a, have a meeting together. And lastly, uh, the holistic education study. So when we're talking about holistic education, what we're talking about is thinking about meeting um, the entire needs of a child uh, or a learner. And so not just looking at uh, academic needs or uh, quote unquote in intelligence, but thinking about what are children or learners naturally curious about? How do we meet social, emotional needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, mental needs, et cetera. And, and kind of stepping away from what school may have originally been designed um, to do, which was kind of uh, you know push push knowledge onto children uh, to be able to uh, become workers later on in life, right? How do we really lean on Ungwehoe uh, or or Haudenosaunee ways of knowing, being, and doing when it comes to education, and see all children and learners as possessing an inherent gift and letting that lead the way in terms of education? So there. Uh, within this paper, there's some best practices that are, are put forward uh, for consideration uh, by the task force, as well as looking at um, what are some current models that are in place in other spaces. And so even looking in at our own community, uh, there, there's some mention of um, Everlasting Tree School and, uh, and the, uh, the foundation of holistic education that they have in operation there as well. All right, in terms of community engagement, so three uh, kind of pieces here. Uh, one, uh, our website, we like to you know, try as best as possible to keep up to date, uh, snlifelonglearning.ca. And again, all of the reports uh, that I've mentioned uh, so far, minus those, those two, which are capital and infrastructure as well as transportation are available uh, for download to be able to reread um, on the website. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to also talk about Othello Engagement, which is our online uh, engagement platform that actually launched uh, kind of right at the start of COVID when we knew that engaging in person was going to be uh, an option that was just not safe um, for us to be practicing. Uh, we launched Othello, and so to be able to sign up uh, for that type of engagement, you can actually click on Get Involved uh, on the, uh, the website, which will link you to that. Uh, we do have community channels that we uh, feed into, such as uh, CKRZ with uh, bi-weekly ed talks uh, that are hosted there. So uh, typically, Michael, uh, Michael Hill and I have been uh, on the, the ed talks on CKRZ 
with either Josh or, or Al Su, uh, where we have spoken about a topic related to education. And right now, actually, those are being, uh, we have reruns of episodes that are going because we have, I think, close to 25 episodes that we've completed. And um, a lot of them are about history of education at Six Nations. And so to just build a greater awareness within the community about the history of, of education uh, on the territory where we are rerunning uh, a number of episodes as well as uh, engagement with Turtle Island News, as well as, as well as Two Row Times in terms of really just trying to advertise uh, the work and invite people to, to engage uh, online. Okay. Lastly, uh, with social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, as you'll see a little bit later in my uh, update here that one of the uh, areas in terms of engagement demographics that we've been trying to work on um, are folks who, who are younger. And so you'll, you'll actually see, I'll have a pie graph that will show up here where you see that uh, folks who are 35 and under are some of our uh, engagement numbers are, are low for that, that demographic. So we're trying to be creative in terms of contests, in terms of social media usage uh, to, to engage folks in, in that way. Okay. Uh, we have quarterly newsletters that are sent out to our website uh, subscribers. So again, at snlifelonglearning.ca, you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, and you will receive uh, updates uh, quarterly from us uh, directly. Okay. Uh, this summer, we also uh, launched a Design uh, Your Dream School uh, youth initiative or youth engagement. And we had a number of really amazing responses come from youth. So within, uh, within that engagement, youth were asked to kind of turn on their creative channels and design their dream school. And so for so many youth, and, and this was something that I think was really lovely to see, uh, they leaned into uh, some things that they really love about the school that they're already at, right? What are really great things that are that are already going on at school? And what are things that they can dream about that they really wish that they would have uh, at their school in the future? And so youth could respond in a number of different uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, a lot of them took the pathway of uh, designing, like actually doing a layout or a map of a school, and then had some writing to go along with it. Uh, other options included, you know, making a video, which some of them did. Uh, very, we have a lot of very gifted. Uh, communicators uh, in the community for sure. Uh, and it was really, really amazing to be able to hear the voices of the youth as well uh, in, in sharing their, their responses or their dreams for school. And these are just some of the, uh, some of the responses that we saw uh, coming from youth uh, that they would hope that uh, at their school, they could have karate instruction, lacrosse stick making classes. There was actually one student in particular um, who had designed a kind of curriculum a uh, high level for uh, his school that surrounded uh, the game of lacrosse in, in general. And so, you know, physical education being about playing lacrosse, uh, history about, you know, teaching about uh, the game of lacrosse um, in terms of uh, actually being able to physically do something with your hands, lacrosse stick making classes, et cetera. A lot of them talked about a pool, which was really interesting. Uh, so many of them said that, you know, they'd really love to have a pool uh, right at school uh, to be able to uh, learn how to swim or to be able to have as a part of physical education. Um, powwow as well as social dancing was something else that was brought up. Uh, Onondaga language instruction was brought up, which was uh, really, really interesting uh, to see that, uh, that that was brought up in terms of an elementary focus, uh, given that we know at, at our schools, that Mohawk and uh, and Cayuga are the two languages that are currently uh, offered, either both or or just one or the other. So it was really interesting uh, to see that that's a, a want uh, and, a, and a need from students. Uh, beading and sewing of traditional regalia. Uh, having a meditating corner was something else that was really uh, interesting that came up. Uh, a student lounge, um, a physical space for actually being able to have meals together, uh, where you would bring together either the whole school or a portion of the school to, to share a meal, uh, as well as cooking classes. So those were some of uh, the ideas from our, our youth in terms of what they want to see uh, in their schools going forward. Thanks. Hey broader community engagement. So the top two are task forces that are either currently in operation or have completed their work. So the governance task team, as well as the funding task team, the Ongui Hongwei advisory group, or we like to refer to them as the OAG, is, uh, is a current uh, task team. And we have a 
um, a link there, a presentation that is hyperlinked to actually Council's, uh, back to Council's Facebook page, that uh, is a, a recording of the State of Our Languages presentation that the Ongwe Hongwe Advisory Group uh, gave back in, uh, in June. So that's just some of the work coming out of that space. A lot of uh, sharing across different entities in relation to language instruction, uh, planning for language instruction going forward, uh, as well as uh, teaching uh, from a cultural or ways of knowing standpoint. A governance focus group is something that is currently operating. And uh, so Michael actually heads up all of the, all of that work in relation to the governance focus group. And what we've been engaging in for the past uh, few months are actually several case studies of uh, Gothnawage Education Center, uh, AMBI, which is Akwasasne uh, Mohawk Board of Education, as well as connecting with folks uh, way out in Mi'kmaq territory in terms of what their education governance looks like. So we've been so fortunate uh, that all of those entities have been very uh, welcoming and have been very transparent in, in sharing information with us in terms of what their trials and tribulations as well as successes have been in relation to education governance. Uh, some upcoming opportunities that we will have as um, we actually, Michael and I presented uh, to uh, the principals of the uh, five federal schools, as well as director of federal schools, Travis Anderson, uh, last week. And uh, we are able to move forward with planning of teacher focus groups, as well as home and school committee focus groups, specifically around uh, governance. So we look forward to, uh, to planning and being able to implement those engagement opportunities uh, in the next few months. Okay. Um, one thing here that I uh, really want to, to highlight, and I think this is such a beautiful example of collaboration in the community, and, and so I never get tired of speaking about this, is uh, if you can actually remember uh, last time we presented in, we talked about a language mentorship pilot, uh, which we had launched with two of our uh, employees at the Education Coordination Office, where one of them was learning uh, Mohawk with a, a proficient Mohawk language speaker, and another was working on it in a mentor uh, with a proficient Cayuga language speaker. And what we saw between January and April is that both of those um, both of those employees actually moved up in the ActBill uh, scale in the language uh, learning assessment scale um, in terms of their proficiency. So from that, uh, actually at the Ongwe Hongwe Advisory Group, we began speaking about, well, how can we broaden uh, our impact in terms of that work, in terms of language mentorship? And so in August of 2022, we were, uh, well, this year, uh, just this past August, we were so fortunate to be able to partner with uh, the Language Commission, as well as Grand River Employment and Training, to be able to offer a language mentorship program to educators and educator assistants within the community. And so we were also very grateful to Six Nations Polytechnic for uh, donating the space uh, for us to engage in a week-long intensive um, in that last week of August, where, and I think this is really important to note, is that all of those educators who were there, it was their last week of uh, summer vacation, uh, but they, they showed up and they were there ready to learn, ready to engage, ready, ready to be mentored and uh, work on their, uh, their language proficiency for the betterment of their students who they were uh, uh, coming into the 22-23 school year. Okay. So the structure, how it works here, is we have two mentors, one who is leading a Mohawk cohort, one who's leading a Cuga cohort. We also have two assistants, one who's supporting uh, each cohort. Uh, within the Mohawk language cohort, we have five mentees. And within the Cuga language cohort, we have uh, nine mentees. And uh, currently, they are continuing with uh, weekly sessions uh, with their mentors in person at, uh, at Gawaneel. So that's, uh, that's kind of the structure here going forward. And this is uh, going to be wrapped up uh, toward the, the end of December. So that's the, the language mentorship uh, program. Okay. So now to move into kind of our final section here, which are uh, insights from our online engagement platform, Othello. So something, you know, I want to be very transparent about upfront, and this is something I heard, I was listening to the live stream before, uh, before we came on uh, here live, is that, you know, engagement, uh, community engagement needs to be, or seems to be something that across many different departments and spaces uh, is, is something that uh, seems to be difficult and seems to be uh, a challenge. 
And so this is one way that we are engaging, which is uh, online. And I, I also really, really appreciate some of the points that have already been mentioned in terms of, well, what does or who, what type of person does online engagement really cater to, right? Um, if you don't have access to technology or access to reliable internet, or if like just engaging online and using technology is just not really within your wheelhouse, then this type of engagement um, is not really, um, doesn't feel accessible to you. And that's something that I think we take very, very seriously within our work and, um, and so what you'll see in the second part of, of this, uh, this piece here is that we actually replicated um, our surveys that we have available on a fellow uh, in paper form and uh, spent a number of sessions throughout the summer uh, setting up at various uh, community awareness events, as well as at Iroquois Plaza to be able to engage where people were able to, you know, like actually put pen to paper. And then we have inputted their data um, on a fellow so that it's all in one place. So so that's just one consideration we've made in terms of how do we make the engagement more accessible. And I think that's something that's going to be a continued conversation because I don't think we have it figured out yet. Uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone does. If anyone does, please, please let us know. We would love those answers. Um, but in terms of how do we create different access points for different people just based on, uh, you know, where they're at uh, for to be able to have their voices heard. Okay. So uh, here's that pie chart I was talking about earlier in terms of ages of participants. So what you can see here is that we've got a big chunk of folks um, who are within that you know, 40 to 60 uh, age range who engage uh, on Othello uh, and a little bit yeah, less from, from the, younger, uh, the younger demographic. Uh, one of the questions we do ask on our Othello engagement is residency status of the participants. So you can see here that uh, just over uh, close to 90% are folks who are uh, on reserve, as well as uh, some folks who are off reserve who have been engaging. Okay. We also ask here in terms of band affiliation. So uh, we've been collecting that, those statistics or those data in terms of are you a Six Nations uh, band member, band member of another First Nation or a non-First Nation band member? Because uh, I think it's just really important for us to, to kind of know who's, who's engaging and, and what lens they're coming from uh, in this engagement. Okay, and then here, this might be a little bit hard to see, um, especially for folks who may be looking on their phone or whatnot. Um, but what we have here also are different identification pieces, right? So asking questions such as like, are you a student? Are you an elementary teacher? Are you a secondary teacher, uh, language uh, teacher, speaker, learner, knowledge keeper, a parent or guardian of a Six Nations elementary student, secondary student? Um, and then other. And, and so what we uh, have noticed here is that so folks have kind of no limitation to what they want to select. They, they could select, you know, three or four of these if they want as it relates to them. Because um, I know myself, you know, I may select that I am a, a student, uh, as I'm, I am a student, but I'm also, you know, a parent or guardian of a elementary student as well. So I'd be selecting two things there. So people were, were able and invited to select as many kind of identifiers as, uh, as it made sense for them. Okay, so now this is just one example of community engagement on a fellow and kind of how it looks on our end uh, once we see people engage. So this was actually, we had some very, very preliminary draft recommendations that were put onto a fellow um, over uh, about, about a year ago uh, around this time. And so this is just an example of how the data kind of comes out on our end. So this very high level, very um, not super structured recommendation was that uh, there needs to be a central hub within the community for language and culture, uh, curriculum, professional development and research, right? So thinking about how do we have a holistic strategy um, and hub within the community where we're able to link all of these different pieces together from early childhood all the way up to um, elder and senior learning, right? How are we able to, to coordinate and bring all of that together? And what we saw is that we had 55% of folks who engaged uh, in, in complete support of that, totally support in about 25% in the slightly support camp. And then you can see there's folks who come in around neutral, uh, slightly opposed as well as totally opposed. Okay. So um, these are kind of the five different uh, ways folks can uh, make their voice uh, heard in terms of going from the spectrum of totally opposed to totally support. 
There is also opportunity for people uh, to actually put comments as well. So we have a number of comments uh, that have been collected uh, in relation to, to some of the, the engagement on Othello. Okay. Uh, one more we wanted to highlight here as well is culture and language. And so the draft recommendation here is um, for Six Nations to ensure the foundational principles of fostering and promoting Haudenosaunee language and culture are integrated into all aspects uh, of the education system in a way that can be measured, reported on and improved over time. And what we see here is within that kind of support you know, slightly support or totally support camp is over 80% of participants when we put those numbers together um, are in, in support of, of establishing that type of, uh, that type of system with uh, language and culture uh, being the foundation. Okay, uh, now we'll shift gears here to our uh, survey and this survey is still very much live. Uh, so we, we invite you to actually go in and be able to take this survey, uh, sneducationsurvey.othello.net. And it's a, it's a short engagement and uh, it, it's giving us insight into different aspects um, of education within the community, including language learning, including how parents and guardians and families can be more involved in school, uh, how uh, elders and knowledge keepers can be more integrated into education learning settings as well. Okay. So what we've seen here, so now this is um, the, the opportunity where the, the paper surveys um, came, came into play. So we actually launched this back at the time of community awareness, and it's still open uh, right now. And, and so those numbers, uh, 80, uh, in terms of 80 respondents, uh, it, is, it is higher now, but at the creation of this slide deck, we were around 80, um, 80 participants. And so these are uh, the questions that were being asked of participants. Um, of course, some demographics, uh, again, in terms of, are you a band member, um, age bracket you belong to. We then presented folks with some numbers in relation to uh, first and language, or sorry, first and second language speakers in the territory, asked if people were interested in learning or furthering their learning of the languages, what are some methods that, that they would prefer in terms of being able to engage in that learning, how seniors and elders can continue their learning journeys, how parents or guardians and families can be more involved in school, uh, as well as any barriers that people were, were thinking about in terms of Six Nations uh, creating or taking responsibility for our own education system across the board. Right? And, uh, and again, so when looking at the ages of uh, respondents here, we see that over half of the respondents are um, between the ages of you know, 50 plus which uh, which was really great. Uh, I think you know having the the paper uh, kind of modality there made it more accessible um, for folks to engage in this way. So that was a really great learning opportunity for us. In terms of just some findings, and this is just we kind of just picked some findings that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, we had eighty four percent of uh, respondents say that they're interested in learning their language. Um, 3% said no, and 13% said they were unsure or, or a maybe to it. Now, the top five language learning uh, options, which is on the bottom of the screen here that, that folks were mentioning, number one, coming in at almost 50%, was learning with elders. So folks were talking about an elders in residence program. Um, so not only you know, within uh, education settings such as schools, but how can we think about elders in residence programs in, in many different spaces within the community, uh, just to be able to provide more access to learning the language. Uh, number two, uh, part-time evening classes. Uh, number three, land-based learning. Four, online learning modules. And number five, one-on-one -on -one mentorship or apprenticeship. And so the the structure of full-time immersion was actually um, one of the lower ranked uh, options that, that folks were talking about in terms of a strategy to learn language. And you know, some of the conversations that we had in terms of the why around that is folks just said, you know, I, I, I don't have the capacity or I don't have the, the time, all right, to be able to, to engage in that. So these were some, some other options that, that people were thinking through. Okay. And then over here on, on the left, these were just some barriers that folks uh, answered 
for that final question that uh, you know we should be cognitive cognitive of and thinking about um, curriculum transportation uh, what are the staffing requirements so there was a lot of really great input in terms of um, you know when when hiring folks to work within our elementary schools right what does the professional development look like for folks who maybe are not from the community right in terms of really ensuring that if we're saying we want a foundation of language and culture what type of professional development is being offered Offered, um, for folks across the board to really ensure that um, that, that lens is, is held uh, so closely and centered in, in their work. Okay. Uh, a few other things that I'll note here, um, ensuring students are on par or better than provincial uh, rates, and that's, that's in terms of um, uh, assessment, uh, language program flexibility, uh, accessibility for full-time staff, um, as well as uh, human resources and, and financial resourcing and, and capacity building there. Right. Uh, so to close, we just have a couple uh, slides here. Uh, one, I, I know we like to talk a, a lot about in terms of what does cross collaboration uh, within our work look like. Uh, we uh, are actually very uh, proud that we uh, have collaboration and uh, have seats at both of these task forces as well, uh, anti-bullying task force, as well as the child and family well-being task force. I think it's just really important that uh, we're able to see that cross collaboration and, and even at just a very bare minimum stay in the know of what is going on in these other spaces as we are all interconnected when talking about uh, well-being, when talking about uh, education, wellness and so it, it's really important uh, you know to us that that we uh, we keep that open line of communication and think about how can we work together uh, in terms of strategy uh, moving forward okay. Uh, not going to read through all of these, just kind of wanted to flash it on the screen in terms of the committee involvement uh, at the Lifelong Learning Task Force. Um, most of these committees, um, the involvement is through uh, the chair of the core team, which is elected counselor Audrey Palace Bombery. Uh, there are a couple of committees where uh, I have attended as education manager, uh, just to you know really be there uh, as an observer and, and bring back information, uh, as well as a, a couple where uh, Clinton, as well as Michael attend again in the same capacity to sit as uh, observers and bring, bring back information. Okay. Lastly, one thing we wanted to touch on is our recommendation writing framework. So as I showed you a while ago, um, with uh, those four different pieces in terms of information processing, we are now in, in kind of the component or the quadrant there where we are shifting to drafting uh, recommendations that we want to put forward to uh, to the community, right, with community. And so we have been working closely with a consultant in terms of what does a recommendation writing framework look like? It's really, really important to us that when these recommendations come out, that they are palatable, that people can open uh, up the recommendations and understand what it is that's being put forward. Uh, we understand that it's not everyone's cup of tea to read through a 400 page report, right? So how do we structure uh, the recommendations in a way that's really accessible uh, that, hey, like if, if you're not someone that has too much know, uh, know how in terms of the education system that you're still able to engage because of course your voice is still very paramount and still very important in terms of how this work, if this work moves forward. And so we've been working closely with a, with a consultant in terms of what the structure might look like. And we've done a, a kind of a, a case study or a trial test uh, with one set of recommendations, which is information management and technology, and, uh, and have been working uh, closely with, uh, with our elected uh, counselor, Audrey, uh, as well in terms of that framework. So just wanted to, to present uh, this uh, to, to you all uh, in terms of we're we're doing a lot of really intentional work in, in terms of how the presentation uh, of the recommendations will look going forward. Um, a lot of uh, incorporation of text, graphics, as well as thinking about um, what are ways that we can engage the community going forward um, in in-person meetings, Zoom, et cetera, to be able to hone uh, and refine those recommendations. And uh, that is about it for us. Uh, just wanted to, uh, again, kind of flash this here at the end. 
this was a, a report that was uh, published for us and done the very kind of beginning of the, of the LLTF uh, by Deloitte in terms of this is what kind of the evolution of the work of the Education Coordination Office should look like. And so we're kind of comfortably here um, in this, uh, this green square in terms of years one through five. Um, the staff at the Education Coordination Office has grown um, and uh, we have also completed all the research opportunities that we set out to do uh, within year one. And uh, so that, that's about it from, from us in terms of presentation. So I'll stop talking uh, and turn it back over to you, Chief Hill, for uh, any questions or uh, comments from anyone on the line. Okay, perfect, Neil. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Heather. Uh, quite uh, quite the presentation and update this round. So thank you so much for all of uh, all of that valuable information. I think we're uh, now getting to a point where this council has been asking for some time in terms of what is the next steps? What's the time frame look like? What are those recommendations or community recommendations and posing those look like? So really excited to see the work continue. Uh, there's a lot happening as you can see from Heather's presentation and the work in her team uh, at the Lifelong Learning Task Force. So at this point in time, I'll open the floor up to any further questions, comments, I'll first begin with uh, Sherry Lynn. Um, just hang on a second. Okay, now you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I get. I guess the part of is like what the chief just said is the timeline because that's the biggest question is, um, this has been in the works for four to five years now, or however long, um, what's the timeline? How much longer are they going to be researching? Those kinds of things. So the community wants to know like, where's this money going that they've received and how is it benefiting us Though that, that way? So is there a timeline or is that gonna be for discussion? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Uh, we had reported back in, I think at our last uh, kind of presentation that was like this, that we uh, were targeting for beginning of releasing of recommendations in summer of 2023, and that is still our, our target. Um, will all of the recommendations come forward uh, at the same time? Uh, we're, we're still in kind of advisement with various consultants in terms of what the best way is to release recommendations um, in a way that is not overwhelming in a way that uh, we can provide enough context of the recommendation going recommendations within that certain bucket uh, going forward so so that the community is able to engage with them appropriately. So summer of 2023 is still um, on target in terms of beginning to to release recommendations. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Heather. Uh, further questions, comments over to you, Greg. Muted. Am I still muted? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of extensive work. Um, yeah. Being being new to council, I um, I think I saw your presentation last your last presentation. Um, looks like you've done a lot of work, very extensive work. Um, well, the question I had is, and I thought I, I think we brought this up before, is our graduation rates at high school. Um, I think you can correct me, uh, Heather, they're around like 40, 45% coming out of grade 12 um, and that they were lacking behind the uh, provincial rates. I think the provincial rates were even all close to 80 or eight above. Is Does this new uh, process, does that address that, that issue to see if we can get our, um, our students' uh, graduate, graduation rates up? Yeah, thanks so much for that really important question. I think kind of I have two answers there. Um, one is uh, within within the work or our framework, uh, yes, in, in terms of taking into consideration what are the, the unique needs of our, our learners uh, within our community is something that's uh, of utmost importance. Uh, one of our studies that was actually um, uh, taken on by Rick Hill was the secondary school study. 
right, in terms of, well, how might we envision secondary school and how might that look different from kind of a more westernized or colonial um, high school experience. And so that's that's a really uh, invaluable uh, report in terms of looking at these different pathways that our learners may be more inclined um, to want to, to learn from. And again, like really acknowledging that all learners possess an inherent gift and not looking at our children from a deficit mindset. So, so that's one aspect um, is taking into consideration the unique needs um, and wants of, of our learning styles um, and, and preferences for learning. And, and two, uh, some of the work that I've been involved in, as well as, I mean, it's mostly uh, Councillor um, Paulus Bombery, is our work in terms of engaging with Grand Erie District School Board, where we know predominantly our secondary students uh, are going, right, is, is to that district. And so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of really great conversations that have been happening in terms of, well, you know, what does transition planning uh, look like from, you know, grade seven, seven, eight to going into grade nine. And I know, uh, you know, the federal schools director, Travis Anderson, has been really instrumental in terms of uh, making those voices heard in terms of like, how do you support that transition uh, for students uh, going, going from uh, the federal schools specifically uh, into secondary to be able to um, to support their um, you know kind of acclimation to secondary and also not view six nation students as as coming in as possessing possessing less um, something I'll, I'll just put kind of right on the table here and be, be very transparent about that we have noted at these meetings is that you know just because we have a student who may be coming in who had done immersion, right, from kindergarten through grade eight. They should not be looked at as possessing less knowledge or being behind the curve when they are going into secondary off reserve. Because to be able to process information in various languages is a gift and is a whole set of cognitive skills on its own. And so we're really, uh, you know, working hard uh, in those conversations to flip the narrative that those students are actually possessing uh, knowledge and cognitive abilities that should really be looked at as as gifts and not as something that is, that is lesser. Um, so yeah, kind of two two answers to your question there. One is kind of an advocacy piece um, with uh, working with local districts and the other is, is in terms of our research uh, that was conducted by Rick Hill. Now for the question. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Heather for, for your response. Uh, I'm gonna continue going down uh, the list here. I have next in queue, uh, Hazel. Yeah, Heather, I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering if um, any consideration has ever been made with regard to Six Nations having a high school on reserve and with a new lifelong learning concept of education here. And once students are ready to go to high school, I often wonder, like before it was that everyone felt it was better for our students to go off reserve and um I guess make new friends etc and stuff like that but with the new concept of learning what's going to be based on culture and uh, language and um, land-based learning etc wouldn't a high school owned by First Nations be um like a I don't know how to say this wouldn't it be better for the students who have gone from junior kindergarten to grade eight with that style of learning and then to stay on reserve with a high school that carries on and uh, uh, the same type of learning? I don't know if you understand my question, but <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for your question. I, I, I totally understand what you're what you're saying. Like, if we're saying, um, you know, that we want to establish this type of framework with language and culture, ways of knowing, ways of being, being the foundation of the system, um, you know, wh why wouldn't we want to keep our students here, right? When they go into, you know, grade nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, to be able to continue um, on on that pathway and and stay in in a system that where that's the foundation. And absolutely, that is. Um, 
that's that's the goal uh, going forward. And so the work that that came out of Rick Hill um, and his secondary school uh, study is is about just that, right? How do we uh, ensure that we've got what's going on right on early years? Uh, that conversation and type of thinking, type of teaching, is then happening in elementary, and then that transitions to high school or secondary. It's the same kind of type of mantra um, that exists there as well. Same type of foundation. Um, I only mentioned uh, kind of local districts um, to uh, Councillor Fraser's question, uh, just to talk about and kind of address right now um, some of the work that's going because we, we also can't lose sight of our, our students who are who are right now, right, in those other systems and how can we best support them. But definitely, uh, for sure, going forward, um, our, our research does take into consideration what would uh, an additional uh, secondary school uh, in, at, at Six Nations uh, look like, right? And what should those foundational pieces be as related to language and culture? Thank you, uh, thank you, Niawa or Heather, for your for your response to to uh, to Hazel's question. Uh, just to, uh, I, I'm not seeing any hand raised at this point in time, but uh, I just have a question for myself, Heather, uh, and maybe um, might be jumping a little bit into where I want to go of summer 2023 with community uh, recommendations. But when we talk about those uh, recommendations and the beginning of those uh, in the transition. Is there any uh, plan to say, regardless of what those recommendations look like in the interim or transition phase, that um, say, for example, could start, say, 2024, September in our current schools? Like, is there is there also consideration give, uh, when having these discussions around, uh, you know, the recommendation writing and so forth uh, of having uh, transition or, or phased in approaches to current uh, federal systems of the schools to kind of get to end goal. Yeah, thanks so much for for your question. I think phased in approach is something. It's like a phrase we've been. I've heard so much lately. And we've been talking a lot about, um, and and I think it's really important to to think about phased in approach because if we think about kind of all these areas where we're wanting to seek improvement, such as education, transportation, building of new schools, and and renovations to current schools, uh, as well as curriculum kind of overhaul here. Um, in addition, right, like what does inclusive or special and gifted education education look like, um, the, the financial kind of governance piece here, as well as human resources, right? If we say, okay, well, 2024, we're going to go like gung-ho and do everything at once, um, seeing success, I, I think will be really, really difficult. And so phasing in um, a, an approach, I think, is is absolutely uh, what, what we're talking about here at the Education Coordination Office and the LLTF in terms of what are these uh, tangible steps that can be taken in each of those areas in year one and then year two and going forward uh, to then, you know, kind of full, full on, you you know, responsibility because we're wanting to ensure that, um, you know, by phasing in that the likelihood of, uh, of success is just higher and that we're able to really measure, right, uh, what is taking place within each of those years, within each of those um, those buckets of, of work, right, to, to ensure that if we need to pivot, if, if there's a change that needs to happen, that we're able to adjust accordingly, versus if you kind of adopt a new framework across the board in all of these different areas, it may be really hard to be able to identify, oh, well, this isn't working and it's affecting over here, right? Like X isn't working and it's affecting Y. Um, so to be able to really isolate situations and also build capacity, right? Something I know that Councillor Wright uh, asked in the last uh, time we were together was how do we build that capacity within the community to ensure that we have um, like community experts that are able to take on an education administration, right? To be able to be experts in information technology, experts in the area of finance, uh, which we know, I, I know is like finding kind of a, a golden egg sometimes when we're talking about finance, right? And so um, that, that also needs to be taken into consideration and not taking off or biting off more than we can chew, um, you know, right off the get-go. So yes, phased, phased in approach is something that um, we will definitely be looking at in terms of structuring the recommendations with the uh, the ones that we kind of already um, uh Kind of gave it a go with in terms of information technology and management. Um, it is looking at a three um, three phase 
uh, phase in process. So that's that's already kind of a consideration in that area of work and uh, and will be going forward in the other areas of work as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks for for your response. Uh, I, that's you know that's exactly um, you know my thinking as well as when you kind of just see all and everything that has to get done. It's like where do you start, right? And it kind of you know has uh, you know like you say the the ability to really not not see the outcomes that that we want. Um, I I and the reason I I really brought that forward is in relation to like say for example, is there areas that we could start like say language. You know all of our language classes within the current school system on reserve uh you know is that an opportunity to maybe start you know uh, like there for example is it an opportunity to maybe even work uh politically on the on the governance side with say council and isk uh, on how schools are federally ran uh, and you know maybe is that opportunity to look at the different models of of teaching and land-based learning and, and so forth uh though you know those are just uh kind of my thinking behind my question is uh, you know, in terms of that phase, and so just kind of more of a, you know, the examples of even say we talked earlier about the political advocacy pieces, you know, with our 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 our, our topic before uh, this presentation, uh, you know, we're really looking to the highlight highlighted pieces of, you know, political work uh, that needs to happen on the Six Nations lifelong learning side of things that we could be of assistance with, uh, you know, in in any next steps. So just kind of background to, uh, I guess, my question. Uh, want to uh, I'll continue to look at the floor uh, for any further questions, comments? Okay, I am not uh, seeing Mark, any. Can't, can't, oh. can't you not see? Can you see me? I can see you now, yes. Because <laughs> I know my, my internet's acting up. Um, yeah, I had, I. I had, I just want a couple of comments. Um, I think you have a great communication plan. Um, I, I think council should be adopting your plan. But the only thing I noticed was I didn't, I don't recall hearing anything about live community meetings. And I think that's very important. In my experience as a counselor, people like having community meetings to have their say. They would rather sit in a community meeting and have their say than to write it on a piece of paper or to go on the internet and ask questions. Because we are, after all, an oral people. And a lot of our people, they don't like writing. They may not feel comfortable writing or they just might put it off if they have to write it. And I really think we need to start getting back to community meetings. But I, I didn't recall hearing you say anything about that. My second comment is, in terms of the hiring, because you talked about the hiring of different, you know, when it comes time to do the hiring, I haven't heard any mention either of how you're going to be dealing with the union. As you know, the, the, our teachers on reserve are unionized. So there's a big issue with dealing with the union. I don't know if that's been um, discussed yet by the committee or if that comes later, but I know that's going to be a big issue. Hey, great. Awesome. Two really, really important questions. And yeah, I, I really hear you in terms of community meetings being um, a place where, you know, being able to actually hear people's stories, I think is something that's really important. Um, something that I'm sure, you know, Michael to, could attest to is he did a lot of the uh, in-person community engagement over the summer. And while he was, you know, tabling, you know, at, at the Iroquois Plaza, there's actually so much that, you know, people would just talk to him about and they would talk about their stories uh, going to school and whatnot. And, and, and that being so valuable and that's not something that's being written down right uh, on on a survey but people being able to just share and be very you know vulnerable or, or transparent there and um and what we saw at our community awareness events that were in person um is just so much more connection and also excitement around what are the possibilities here in terms of moving forward with education and and something i, I do want to share is that uh, in-person sessions are uh kind of in in the works for those uh, teacher focus groups that we uh, that I spoke about earlier, as well as the home and school committee um, uh, focus groups going forward. Uh, we're wanting to do an in-person approach as well as, you know, consider hybrid for folks who don't feel comfortable in person. Uh, so have a Zoom link or, or Teams or whatnot so they can tune in. And then going forward in terms of um, honing recommendations and presenting recommendations, being able to, yes, host community meetings. I think 
sometimes, you know, uh, messaging can get lost or context setting can get lost when it's just like, oh, you know, read this brief or read this memo and then engage, right? If we're able to actually be there and tell the story of how, you know, these recommendations came about, how folks were engaged with, uh, then we're able to, to provide um, provide more context for people. So yeah, really, really appreciate those points and they are, uh, they are uh, in the works for upcoming engagement. And then really important point and question in terms of the union. So actually at our last meeting that we had with uh, federal schools principals, as well as the director of uh, federal schools, Travis Anderson, um, Michael Freeman, who is the, the point person for policy um, at, at the federal schools, um, you know, did bring up that point as well, which we really appreciated. And that's, I know, something that um, that counselor Palace Bombery has, has been talking about with us as well in terms of starting those conversations um, with, with the union that currently represents those teachers and, and you know, talk about options, talk about, well, what, what does this mean for our work going forward um, and, and have those very frank discussions. So that's, uh, I, know, I know that's something that's on the minds of a lot of educators. So I really appreciate you bringing that forward and, you know, kind of just want to state that that's something that is on our radar in terms of having those direct conversations um, with, uh, with union president and union representatives. Okay, thank you, uh, Niawa, uh, Heather, for, for those responses uh, to, to Helen's uh, questions. Uh, I have Melba in queue uh, next. Yes, um, concerning uh, what Audrey has said many times, Audrey Paulus, the foundation of uh, education is culture and language. And connected to what you mentioned, uh, Nathan had mentioned uh, about building capacity. Um, a couple of years ago, I did ask that question. If we're going to have a foundation of who we are around our language and culture, do we have all Native teachers? And you mentioned professional development. Is that good enough is what I'm questioning right now. Is that good enough to build capacity? Um, that is a question. And the other part is the language itself concerning coinciding with family, concerning uh, children learning their language. Is that being discussed and planned how that will happen? Because we certainly know you can learn your language, but if you don't have someone to actually practice and use your language, uh, it's not gonna work very well. We know that across the board. So I'm asking, what is being done? What is the decisions and discussions around coinciding with family language and children's learning in the school? Great, thank you so much for that question. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer your second one because it's top of mind actually. Um, one of the points that came up in our most recent survey um, from families and guardians was a desire to actually have uh, after school sessions or, or kind of learning classes uh, around language that actually aligns with the curriculum that students would be learning uh, in the classroom, right? So for example, right, if um, let's say students were learning, um, you know, just how to introduce themselves, right, in the language, let's say, you know, kindergartners were learning how to introduce themselves in the language, you know, state their name, um, nation, clan, et cetera. Um, how might we structure um, parental guardian family classes or sessions uh, to coincide with that, right? So whatever kids are learning in the class, um, that parents would be offered that same type of, of learning as well so that they're able to support because I, I think you bring up such an important point that yes, you could be learning the language, but then if you go home and you don't have anyone to speak to, right? Like how, how does that learning um, become holistic or, or not, right? And, and um, how is it reinforced or not? So I think that's, uh, that, that's such an important point and, and something that we've been hearing from parents and guardians, uh, which uh, we are definitely taking into consideration in terms of strategy moving forward uh, with parental and community engagement. Uh, on the first question in terms of building capacity uh, within a system or within the community and is professional development good enough? Um, I, I think something that, that we're having a lot of conversations about is how do we also prioritize um, and, and encourage folks to go into education related fields 
in post-secondary, right? And, and I think it's one of those really tough things because for a number of years, um, you know, places such as Grand River Post-Secondary Education Office have been really instrumental in um, identifying gaps in terms of health, right? In terms of social work and really uh, prioritizing in the narrative being, okay, well, you know, we, we need more folks to be going into these fields um, and, and really promoting those fields. And so something that, that we're going to be strong advocates for is how do we also have that same type of messaging around education related fields, right? Because uh, we're, we're needing folks to want to go into uh, the education field, whether whether it's teaching, whether it's um, you know clinical psychology with children, whether it's thinking about providing education for students with special needs, et cetera, right? And, and that be folks from our own community who are engaging uh, in in that type of uh, the, that type of post-secondary uh, education. So that, that's one way that we're thinking about how do we how do we address that? Um, I think professional development, uh, is one of those things that can help bridge gaps uh, going forward. And, you know, as we go through kind of a phased, uh, a phased in or a phased transition, if that's the, the decision, um, that uh, PD can be something that that helps along the way to, to like I said, fill in, uh, fill in gaps uh, where they're needed uh, until we do have a greater capacity of folks from the community uh, who are, uh, you know, stepping, stepping into the education field. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Heather, for your response to uh, Alpha Melbourne's uh, comments and questions. Now, looking to the floor for any further uh, following questions, comments. I'm just going to scroll across my screen. Okay, I'm not uh, seeing any hands raised at this point in time, so I'll look back to the agenda. Uh, which is recommendation 5-1 that the Six Nations of the Grand River Electric Council accept the lifelong learning task force presentation update as information. Is there a mover and seconder to that effect? Moved by Hazel. Sorry, I just want to Michelle, clarify. Michelle said she had moved second. Okay, sorry. So it's moved by Hazel and seconded by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. Well, thank you so much, uh, Heather, to, to you and your team, everybody who joined us on the call today. Uh, again, uh, to Greg's point, a lot of extensive work happening. We see it and it's very appreciative uh, and look forward to our next steps as we uh, move through this journey together. So, Nyawa. Nyawa to you all for your, your great questions um, and, uh, and comments as usual and uh, have a great rest of your meeting. Ona. Ona, thank you. Uh, okay, Council, I'm going to continue to move along here on our agenda. Uh, that does complete after Heather's presentation that uh, completes our delegation and presentation portion of the agenda. Uh, so that'll lead us into the adoption of the political liaison minutes of September 26th. I'll give time to review the minutes. reviewing I'll look to a mover in seconder to accept uh, the political uh, liaison minutes of September 26th she moves she moves Michelle moves okay moved by Michelle seconder second by Greg are there any further questions or comments in relation to the minute Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. 
Uh, okay, that leads us now into council into number seven on our agendas, which is update and recommendations uh, from our lands and resources department. Uh, we have a number of staff uh, on hand uh, that can assist uh, with any questions that may arise. Uh, so I'll first begin uh, with recommendation 7-1, uh, which all of these should be within uh, your Dropbox. Uh, and 7-1 is again, Six Nations of the Grand River elected council to accept uh, the update from the Six Nations of the Grand River Archaeological uh, Department. Uh, maybe what I can do really quickly uh, while people are going to that is ask uh, Tanya, good morning, Tanya uh, Hill, uh, to maybe uh, provide just a high level uh, overview of the report and update. If there's anything of flagging that should be noted. Uh, and if there are any further questions or comments. So over to you, Tanya. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so today I'm, I'm bringing forth uh, an archeological update. Um, uh, Melba requested uh, last meeting that I let everyone know where our monitors are. So here, it, here we go today. So um, first and foremost, I want to sort of introduce the program. So uh, currently this year, 2022, we have, um, 28 representatives well we started with 29 so that that includes uh 26 community members um i have two archaeologists uh who are non-community members and um they assist our team with um you know some of their expertise i actually had an osteologist a bioarchaeologist um early in the season to help identify bone on site because you know with some of our work we've um come across a, a few burial sites this year um do, do, do. so i just kind of wanted to break down so our first year uh, when i started the position on uh, 2020 we had 16 field liaisons uh 2021 we had 24 uh 2022 as i as i stated earlier um 28 so our program is uh continually um increasing and um good and bad i guess um we have um roughly 100 sites, which include agricultural fields, um, housing developments and road construction. And um, our field uh, representatives are generally fully engaged. Uh, our program is fully engaged. And, and with, with me saying that our expectations are uh, fully engaged with uh, compensated monitors on site, uh, reports of review in early stages, um, and also, you know, early discussions on what are these projects um, entailing? What is their, what are they actually proposing uh, to do with this land? Uh, who is generally involved, I guess? We have um, always, you know, three different representatives. We have the Mississaugas of the Credit. We have the Haudenosaunee Development Institute. And a lot of times um, we have um, also joining us is the Huron-Wenda and the Curve Lake. So that kind of when, for the most part, it's generally just um, Mississaugas of the new credit and HDI. But when we get in the Toronto area, we 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 see you know the Curve Lake and um, here on one deck uh, brothers and sisters. Um, I broke it down today into stages because you know it's a lot it's a lot easier for me to explain you know with an update what stage we're sitting on because some of our field work will go over, you know, two or three field seasons. So I broke this down into a stages. So the stage one is generally a desktop search um, that, that goes through, you know, mapping, it goes through um, areas just in ensuring there's actual potential in the area. So a lot of times that, that mapping um, goes through like GIS um, of current areas that where they're gonna propose development. So once that's determined in that stage one, they, they like to see what type of culture heritage and interest do we have for this proposed area? So once we kind of sort of check that box off and you know, stage one, you know, we have potential here, we move on to the stage two and that's where we kind of get boots on the ground and we're like either walking the field through a pedestrian survey. So in a pedestrian survey, we, we walk generally from one to 2.5 meter intervals and a whole farmer field once it's plowed. So that's one way that we do a stage two. 
But sometimes, you know, we're not always in agriculture fields, we're in areas that there's highly disturbance. So in disturbance, I mean that there could be already a proposed building that's, are, well, a building that's already there, it's not proposed, but um, there's already construction that has occurred. So when those circumstances take place, we actually have to do test pits to ensure that there's um, culture heritage and value there in that area. And the test pits are usually about 30 centimeters diameter. Sometimes they can go down to 120 centimeters to, you know, to determine if there's any artifacts in, in the area. So if we have, you know, you know th that work concluded, um, and there has been findings, then we move on to a stage three. So stage three, we're starting to get a lot more intense. We, we found that there was an uh, area of interest with either the pedestrian survey or the test pit. So then we'll move on to doing units in the area. Um, once units are um, conducted, and again, they, they lead to expansions, we go on to a stage four. Stage four is a very comprehensive block excavation. So that's when we're gonna start taking, taking the, the area down. We're gonna start expanding under 10 by 10 uh, meter areas. Um, so, you know, that, that it's all time consuming and, and that's like to get to the stage four, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that, that it, it can go over the three and four year period. So when you see stage four, we're more than likely been there for a while. Um, does anybody have any question, I guess, with the stages? I'll move on to some of the, the area that we're, that we're, our field representatives are working in. No, don't see no questions. So, okay, so right currently um, we're in Kitchener. I'll start with Kitchener. So we've been over the past three years, uh, 2020, we are at Fisher Hallman. So Fisher Hallman was a site very unique um, they decided that they were going to do a roundabout, roundabout in the area. Um, there was a lot of potential in the adjacent area, so we knew we had uh, culture, heritage, and value and interest for that spot. Um, we started stripping back the road. I believe it was seven layers of topsoil and asphalt and stone. So we stripped that all back and we came up with a, a very significant uh, village site. Um, we've completed that stage four this year. So there was roughly around 80,000 artifacts that were recovered there. Um, this site actually was in the media a couple times. Um, so we'll move around the corner, um, probably about 2.5 kilometers away. We were at another site called Huron South. Uh, Huron South, South is, um, it was found in a stage two pedestrian survey and there was a significant amount of artifacts that were on top of the uh, soil right in the farmer's field. So we were walking that field at 2.5 meter intervals and just a significant amount of um, artifacts were just on the surface. So we're con we've, we've since, I guess, probably around 2022, we're sitting at a stage four finally. So 2020, we started, we're sitting at a stage four, which is gonna go on for a few more years. Um, we found a significant amount of artifacts, um, points, uh, drills. Um, we've, we've actually, this is one of our burial sites. So we have a significant amount of uh, human remains, lots of animal fauna and um, so that's basically Huron South. And I might add that Huron South is, is adjacent to a Van Ort ossuary. So we have 13 individuals already in this ossuary. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I kind of highlighted that because this site is very significant. Um, findings moving forward, I really can't comment to that, but we do know this whole area is of significance. So um, moving on over to Hagersville. So we have two different sites currently, um, Smith Farms and Nasser Lands. So Smith Farms is, um, it's just down by the hospital there. Uh, I, I believe Empire is um, extending um, their housing development there. So we're on that site. 
We're only on a stage three there for doing test units. So we don't have a whole lot of findings that I can actually, um, there was a lot of flagged in because I imagine anybody that drove down that road seeing an astronomical amount of flags in there. But we're right now we're starting to do the unix so I don't have a full comprehensive report on on the findings for Smith farms, but there is um, a, a lot of significance of artifacts there. Uh, Nasser land as well so Nasser land is actually adjacent to the quarries. Um, another housing development proposed for Hagersville um, there's not a whole lot of information that I can provide besides that this field season was our field first field season and we're only are sitting in a stage two and just going into a stage three, we haven't reached that far yet. So everything's been flagged in on the stage two. So um, there'll probably be more updates um, continuing on that site at the end of the year. Caledonia, um, Caledonia, we have Avalon. So we've been on Ca Caledonia for roughly, you know, probably five years, but you know, three years in my position. Um, there's roughly four sites there. So we have Seneca Creek, we have McClung, we have Georgia Pacific and Gateway. So as you guys can travel through Caledonia now, you can see all the, the development has been moving rigorously um, with mo putting roads in and stuff. So Gateway, Seneca Creek and Georgia Pacific have been, and gate, they've been cleared. So they're cleared of no more archeological potential that's there. Avalon, um, we've probably going to be completing that today or tomorrow. That's the stage four there for Avalon. It, it's been um, continuing over a few years as well with, you know, not a whole lot of findings, a lot of lithics. So lithics would be, you know, um, the primary stages of constructing points. So lots of lithics been found there, a few points, nothing totally um, besides lithics that's been found in Caledonia. Um, Mississauga. So we'll move over to Mississauga. Um, there's been some really very unique findings here. We've been finding a different amount of ground stones. So um, it's adjacent to the to Credit River. So potential there is extremely high. Uh, we're sitting in a stage four block excavation currently, and um, I don't have a whole lot of report yet. So I think that one again is going to be another one that I'll be bringing up to date, probably in December when our field season is complete and I'll have a whole comprehensive report on those, on that, on, on Hallen and Mississauga Park. Mississauga Park, we found um, also um, a small fragment of human remains. So so it's, it's really significant and um, Georgetown. So Georgetown, Lindsay Court is um, another significant site. We actually have a village site going on here. Um, it's in a stage four. It's been going over the last since 2019. So I've been involved with this project since 2020 and it just keeps on growing and we just keep finding more features of a village there. Vaughn, um, this has probably been one of my most significant prog projects for being problematic. It's been really difficult because this, this Scandahut village site is, it's been sitting idle for about 10 years now. Um, an archeology span company, what was extremely disgruntled, went in there, started excavating with an MTR, meaning that they went in there with equipment to strip the soil back. And um, there's been, um, an astronomical amount of human remains that have been recovered. So we've been taking a, a extra care on making sure that our ancestors are, are, are being cared for in a proper manner on this site because there's been a lot of disrespect over the years with disgruntled archaeology companies. So we're getting ready to close that site up for the season. Um, as you're aware, it's starting to get cold and wet and, you know, we don't want to be, you know, disturbing our ancestors and in that site when, you know, conditions aren't adequate. Uh, Nanny Coke. So Nanny Coke is one that's probably been in the media quite frequently. We are on that site. We are doing archeological work. Uh, we're working on some stage two and three there in different areas. So we've been spending time field walking. Uh, we've been doing units. We've been doing some uh, test pits. Some of the units have come back positive. So we have had some points um, been found this year. So 
we're going to be spending, I imagine, the next two or three years on that project before anything's going to be able to be cleared and moving forward. Uh, Metrolinx. Metrolinx has an astronomical amount of uh, work going. To, um, we're only right now currently with the capacity of our monitors, we're only on First Parliament, and which is Corkstown uh, Front Street, downtown Toronto. And they're basically demol demolishing buildings. And we've been in our, in our units, we've been finding like old train tracks and stuff like that. So a lot of historical stuff, um, not a whole lot of indigenous finds, mostly historical. Ontario line, we just started our stage two, um, not a whole lot of findings to date. So I just wanna make sure that you guys are all aware that we are um, spending time with Metrolinx. Pipelines. So we've over the course of the last three years, we've been on a number of uh, different pipelines. We've been on Imperial, we've been on Trans Northern, Sun Canadian. Um, the Imperial Oil's done a uh, Water Down the Finch project. So started in Water Down, ended in Finch, and they're changing and, and boreholing a lot of uh, pipe in that area. Um, all monitors pretty much been on site throughout that project. And it's been it was going you know within the last couple of years, but ended um, this field season. Brian Oxford with Sun Canadian. That's been a, another village site. Um, I'll update that one in my next uh, December meeting, as in regards to some of the the features that we've been finding there. Uh, Branford. It's pretty much you know. Some areas are idle, uh, Burkitt's Lane, we're still waiting. It's ongoing conversation with Burkitt's Lane with uh, the survivor secretary. So I'm highly and heavenly engaged with the survivors for this project. Uh, Garden Ave is another housing development, but there has not been a whole significant amount of fines there. Hardy Road's been very significant. So this is an a quarry by Oak Park Road. Um, lots of significant fines, but we totally, um, mitigated the whole area so there is no for further work there at this time. Arrowdale, after you know a few years we've we've managed to get onto the Arrowdale site so um, we're doing some stage three units there. I think that's going to start back again tomorrow. Um, lots of significant finds there as well and I'll, I'll, I'll keep everyone up to date with that one. They are proposing for Arrowdale avoidance and protection but um, I haven't had a comprehensive plan with them to see what the avoidance of protection is gonna look like. Um, some of the others work that the archeological department's been working on is some commemoration of archeology span sites. So uh, New Dundee reached out to me and they wanna you know, have conversations in regards to what's it gonna look like if we wanna commemorate old uh, protected sites and um, some of these old protected sites are from the you know, 70s and 80s and you know, there hasn't been adequate um, protection taken place through any type of policy stating and, and mapping even, I mentioned as mapping as well, because some of our sites become impacted because you know, there hasn't been any proper mapping and protection of them. So I'm working with New Dundee now. Our conversations have just started. So we're gonna you know, continue to see what, you know, what works for, for everyone and make sure and, um, you know, the commemoration would be correct and, and, and respectful. So we'll be revisiting that one as well. Um, Babby Point in Toronto, I'm a part of that um, discussion as well. So it's a Heritage District Protection Plan that they're proposing. So Babby Point is um, adjacent to um, the Humber River. And there's a significant amount of um, our ancestors that have been recovered in the past. So they want to make sure that you know, everyone's at the table ensuring that you know, nothing's going to be impacted and there's going to be, you know, respect and protection mechanisms put in place and policy and um, to ensure that there won't be any impacts to that area when it comes to um, uh, development. Uh, Kitchener Museum, so, you know, I'm revisiting conversations with them as well because I've actually asked them to respectfully not have conversations in regards to any type of museum exhibits due to the fact that Fisher Hallman did have um, 80,000 artifacts and there was a little, um, there was some human remains that were recovered there. So I asked for, for them to step back and, you know, and request for some respect there. 
Um, so what they're proposing is they want to take some of the artifacts, they want to do a scan, they want to have like a high level um, drone fly through there and have like our interactive process of um, when visitors come to the museum, they want the, you know, the people to be able to re-interact of what this uh, village site would have looked like in the past. So again, premature um, conversations in regards to that one, but they want to take an interactive approach and they want to want to involve the communities. Um, collaborative projects. So I'm a part of McMaster. Um, I've had discussions with them, you know, not so often right now as it's been really busy with the field season. We've had uh, McMaster clay study. So they've been taking different types of clay from the Royal Botanical Gardens and we're gonna, they're gonna move on to other areas and take that um, specimens of clay and figure out, you know, what clay has been the most workable clay and what areas to be able to create pottery. So that's pre premature as well. So I'm bringing a lot of this stuff to you guys pretty early, but I rather bring it early for um, involvement um, McMaster uh, also is involving Six Nations with a food sovereignty project. So they're basically testing the proteins and lipids extracted from pottery. Um, they're trying to generate some data to figure out what was the utilization of the pot. Um, they want to seek Indigenous knowledge on this project. Uh, they're proposing a date on November 30th at the gathering place for a information session. So I just want to bring that force to everyone. Uh, Mohawk Institute, I meet every Wednesday at 11 with um, their survivors to ensure that some of the work that I'm doing um, and maybe some of the, the reports from the past can assist with the group. Um, do, do, do. So yeah, we're, I'm, I'm just collaborating with them um, constantly because some of the archaeology there we need to make sure is either going to be cleared or sonar needs to um, can be conducted first in that 500 acres. Ontario Archaeology Association. So this year they're having a, a symposium at McMaster in sustainable archaeology. So sustainable archaeology is where they house all of our artifacts um, that come off site. So it's a weekend long um, and it starts on a 28th and they're going to be discussing, you know, different mechanisms that they could probably put in place to help, you know, make the, the archaeology world a little bit more indigenous friendly, I guess we'll call it. Um, this year they're having um, field representatives. So all of our field representatives who are out on site, they have the opportunity to, to attend this symposium and speak from, you know, what their experience is on the ground. So they're trying to, to work this, um, this symposium this year on a, on, on a lot more inclusive. Uh, University of Waterloo. So this is another project that we've been working on. Um, so this is a GIS project. This is with the faculty and students of the University of Waterloo. Um, it's, it's basically we're trying to develop an integrated data um, based with GIS program for archaeology, historical and environmental information of the Halderman track and larger um, territory. Uh, da, 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 da. It's basically, we have been awarded a uh, partnership development through a grant with Social Sciences, the Humanities Research Council. So it's called the Six Miles Deep Mapping and Histories of the Environmental Transformation of the Grand River Territory of the Haudenosaunee. Um, part of this research is going to be um, interviews going to be conducted so the interviews would be with myself and film and tour so and those um, interviews are going to be about the impacts of the province's archaeological and heritage policies and practices that affect six nations um, all the information from the project um, and interviews will be retained by lands and resources. And with permission from council, we would like to see, you know, what the proper pro process would be in place. Would we have to be reaching out to ethics as, you know, ethics will be involved with the University of Waterloo. Um, so I guess that is everything for my update today. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer those.
Thank you, Yala uh, Tanya, for providing us uh, with uh, quite the extensive uh, update, and I think it's uh, it's really uh, really good uh, to uh, for you to uh, come in front of council and provide this update for community knowledge as well. Uh, you know, I think it's really important when we talk about earlier again uh, our community uh, being uh, you know informed of of the work that's happening specifically in the archaeological department uh, through lands and resources. So, really appreciate your report. Uh, I'm going to look to and uh, open the floor for further questions and comments. I'll first begin uh, with Melba. Um, so it's Sherry Lynn. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, Sherry. Lynn. Yeah, it's okay. I'm just going to, uh, I guess there's a couple of things. Um, sitting at Keyway for Chiefs of Ontario, that um, just what you just seen too, Chief, uh, the resolution that's going for November for the Chiefs to um, call on the government. And there's, I think there's, what is there, six uh, resolutions for regarding the government to, to, step, to step up more, and that's regarding the legislation. Um, I think also monies for uh, when the remains come back. So that's going to be um, at the Chief's Assembly in November for that. The other thing is, I guess, for, for us at Six Nations is where it's at for us. I know that's at the coup stage, but for us at Six Nations regarding the legislation, um, changing it instead of, and we've talked about this for months, but also two is monies. If Tanya says they're in at McMaster being held there because we don't have anywhere to hold them here. So just where those discussions are and um, I guess a plan for that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sherilyn, for uh, for for uh, those uh, questions and comments. Uh, just first of the Kiwash, I know there's emails going back and forth, and uh, Tanya, we could touch base off the line uh, on that specifically. But uh, looking to further response, Tanya, on uh, Sherilyn's other points. Um, yeah, you know, I just want community members and, and and council to understand too that we are the only ones that have to have a plan in action in place to bring back our, our, our heritage, our artifacts, our ancestors. You know, most of the, the housing of this, of our artifacts, our heritage is basically in the basements of archeologists. Or last week I met in Fort Erie with the archeology span company and they said that theirs are actually in um, transport truck trailers. So, you know, it, it's really oppressive when we have to you know, us have a contingency plan in place that, you know, we'll give this back to you when you're ready. Well, you know what, that is very unacceptable to me because it's like nobody else has to have, has to have any rules in place. No, no contingency plan to, to, to bring things back, right? Just us. So I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted that because, you know, they're, they're, the rules are, are not working to, you know, others advantages at, you know like we there's no there's only rules for us so just want to make sure that I pointed that out and involvement too so as I went through my list today we are legislationally and policy wise we're, we're we're only to be engaged in a stage three and four process so I fight um I shouldn't say fight I an elder told me not to use that word so I'll, I'll rescind that word I I work real strongly in my position to ensure that um, we're in that planning stages. So I, I've advocated very strongly there. So I wanted to make sure that I, I pointed that out because a lot of community and, um, and council don't realize that those rules, again, are, don't work in our favor. They have us in the, the, the ending stages of archaeology. Thank you. Okay, thank now, you. Uh Thanks, uh, Nyala Tanya, for that. And I think you've highlighted a really important piece as well when we talk about the political advocacy, especially around legislation. That's exactly, you know, the governance work that we, uh, you know, we need to get to in order to, uh, you know, see the necessary changes that reflect to our own advantages. Like, you know, obviously can see the frustration, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the certain rules, uh, you know, specifically to Six Nations and why that's in place uh, not across the board, but only for us. You know, I think that's something, uh, you know, that we definitely need to address. Uh, the other thing uh, that, and this is more long-term thinking and bigger picture thinking is, 
when we, you know, when we talk about the housing of these important artifacts, um, you know, I think we, and we see, and I know Councilor Sherry Lynn has, has brought this, uh, you know, to me at times, uh, just different communities uh, in, in building cultural centers or museums. I know obviously we have, uh, you know, the, the Woodland Cultural Center and so forth, uh, you know, but even the work that's happening at the Survivor Secretariat, like we need to be able to showcase this and to tell our story through all of our artifacts and findings and research and so forth. So, I mean, I think at the at, at the end of the day, we should start to, you know, really converse about what does it look like of our own bigger, you know, huge uh, building of housing each of these. I know we talked about this with, uh, you know, the library and archival center and so forth. I think that's just one one arm of this. This your your work specifically and the work of happening at the survivor secretariat level. I mean, I think th those are just even further, uh, you know, uh, testaments of the work that we need to do to make sure that this is, you know, it's all about education. It's about educating uh, our people, I think, first and foremost, but also educating the, our, our, our allies. And I think that's something that, you know, with this building or a build like it, uh, we could start to, uh, you know, really showcase exactly how strategic and how, you know, intellectual our ancestors truly were. And I was glad to hear uh, your, your work, uh, your partnership with McMaster University uh, in, you know, in, in terms of the pottery and what those were used for in terms of the food sovereignty, because as you may uh, be aware, you know, our council is looking at, at food sustainability and connecting the dots across the board with, you know, farmers and so forth and what that looks like on the environmental side of things. So I guess my point being at the end of the day, uh, you know, there may be things already happening in the works of, uh, you know, what does it look like of our, our, our bigger cultural museum center where we could, you know, start to house these and show and display these uh, important artifacts across the board uh, and to really start to build upon what that, you know, plan could look like. So I just wanted to highlight those pieces. Uh, I do see an, a couple hands raised uh, over to uh, you, Melba, and then Lonnie uh, has his hand raised. Uh, Melba, you have the floor. Yeah, and I guess I guess that's what I'm I'm coming talking about in the sense of for us that if we're going to start doing these changes, is these political things have have come to the table, and I guess that's where it's at. Where are they at? How how are we moving forward in um, getting some resolutions for for the legislation, but also if it's monies or what it is or or the built the build of it, those kinds of things. Because you're right, it's all political. And I guess the question is, is where is that at? Because it's been on the table here um, for a while now. Thanks. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherilyn, for bringing that forward. And again, uh, I think we can even touch even further, expand uh, Tanya off the line in terms of just that political piece and mm -hmm. you know those changes uh, that we need to take to the different levels of government, including the Chiefs of Ontario. Uh, Lonnie? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Mark, I don't want to interrupt Tanya, but I, I've been getting uh, emails from the lawyers and uh, on the uh, litigation part in the camera, and they say that they're they're kind of restricted on time. So I, I was wondering whether after Tanya's finished, if there's any possibility, I don't know, of going in camera so that the, we can hear from the lawyers on the litigation. Okay, uh, sorry, Lonnie, uh, just to confirm, do you know their time, their max time? Like when are they available till? Well, Robert uh, Jane said he's going to leave within the next half an hour or so, and uh, and Iris said she's only got an hour left. So uh, okay, uh, I'm just wondering, Lonnie, is there any possibility to even maybe transfer it over until tomorrow at General Council? Is there any availability? Can you maybe respond or or pose that? Okay, I can see what they'll say. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then in the case that that's not, uh, then we'll look to adjust as we see fit for the agenda. Okay. I okay. don't know, maybe some, maybe uh, somebody like Max could stay, but I'm not certain whether he can or not. But I know Iris and, and Robert will have to go shortly. Yeah, I think Iris and Robert are, are key to be there. So uh, maybe just pose that question, Lonnie, and then just re okay. reply back in the chat and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, uh, Melba. Oh, yes, I wanted to thank Tanya for for her extensive uh, 
report. I think it's very important for council as well as the community mm -hmm. in respect to transparency and respect. I think that's important. Uh, what, you, what you've done for us today to understand. Now, I wanted to say, I understand I was approached by one of your employees that they have a long standing service to this particular job. And I'm just wondering if you have recognition awards like other departments of council at times. Mm -hmm. That is definitely something that I'm gonna look forward to and, um, and have discussion with um, office here because you know with COVID and I started the position in 2020 and I think that recognizing the, the work, the sensitive work that our monitors are out, well, I don't like to call them monitors, representatives are doing on out on site it's a lot of it's a lot of weight to carry, and they definitely need a recognition. So with with COVID now, you know, sort of taking the backdrop and us being able to gather again, most definitely we're going to look in the in the winter months when we're when it's downtime to make sure we can recognize our guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, we haven't even been able to have field monitor school be, because we couldn't gather. So you know, we're looking forward to um, you know next season. Probably in April, I'll give you an update of, of what a lot of things are going to be looking like in regards to that. That's great. And thanks, uh, thanks, Melba, for bringing that forward as well. And, and Tanya, for your response, I think that's important, uh, especially like you say, it's it's heavy work. Uh, you know, the, the emotional, uh, spiritual, mental, everything uh, involved in this type of work. So that definitely uh, needs to, uh, you know, it, it doesn't go un unnoticed, I'll tell you that much. So please. I'll relay that message on and in the gratefulness of this council to uh, to all of the representatives and doing that work. Well, such important work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, I can see so much more collaboration, like as the comprehensive um, education one that was on before me, you know, there's so much benefit I could bring to that the, the in community um, schools. And I'm looking forward to my next um, look ahead of, of bringing some of these artifacts to our school for our children. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate Nyawa, Tanya, for all of your work that you do as well. And, and again, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll uh, we can discuss further on those uh, those you know those uh, key uh, legislative changes as well. Uh, just in terms of the wording, I know I think is, is specific to some of the uh, you know resolution being put forward at the Chiefs Assembly in November. So I uh, look forward to have that discussion with you on a on a couple other topics as well. Um, and at this point in time, I'm not seeing any specific uh, further questions or comments uh, for Tanya, so I, I will look for a motion uh, to accept uh, the update uh, from the archaeological department as information at this time. Looking to a mover and seconder. I will, Sherry Lynch. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. I'll second it, Melba. Seconded by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, Niawa, again, Tanya, for joining us this morning. Uh, again, very extensive report. I really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, look forward to, again, uh, our, uh, our discussions off the line. Niawa. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Council, I'm going to uh, just want to check in really quickly before I go to my next item. Lonnie, were you able to just provide a response? I just or, sent him an email. I'm waiting. They should respond in a few minutes. Okay, just confirm in the chat, Lonnie. And we'll go from there. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, Council, that leads us into our next recommendation under lands and resources, which is recommendation 7-2. Uh, again, uh, this is, and you, you'll have your information within your Dropbox. Uh, but it's basically whereas the Dunville Marsh is located within Six Nations traditional territory uh, and provides ecological and wildlife resources to the Six Nations community. And whereas the Six Nations Wildlife and Stewardship Office has previously assisted with the protection and monitoring of this area in partnership with Nature Canada. And whereas there is a need for increased protection of the Dunville Marsh from further development, given its primarily private ownership status, Therefore, be it resolved that Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council provide a letter of support for the protection of the Dunbell Marsh as an important ecological area. So I'll just look to uh, who I believe, is it Lauren, uh, will be speaking uh, to this item. Lauren, just not sure if there's anything further or Taylor that you have uh, would like to add. 
Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you got most of it. Um, generally, just this is a very important area, the Dunville Marsh, it's located just outside of Dunville. It has been identified as an important ecological area, um, a provincially significant wetland, and is uh, home to a historical roost for tens of thousands of swallows, which are globally declining species, many of which are stated as being endangered, threatened, special concern. Um, it also obviously has a whole bunch of ecological resources that may in the past and present be of importance to Six Nations community, for sustenance, medicinal plants, fishing, hunting, things like that. Um, and as you said, it's uh, currently the protect protection of this area isn't guaranteed um, because a lot of the marsh is owned under private ownership. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Okay, thank you, Nyawa, uh, 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 Lauren, for that. Uh, looking to open the floor for, for the questions or comments, I'll first begin with Greg. Okay, he says, the Attorney General's office got in touch with me about the Six Nations land claim. I said, hold on. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes, uh, sorry, oh, okay. really, really quickly, uh, Greg, I just want to make sure. I uh, want to know if it had any historic, uh, histological, uh, historical uh, significance to us that's all okay. sorry just really quickly uh just before lauren you respond uh lonnie can i get you to go on mute or right, hear some feedback okay okay thank you for that uh sorry greg did you just want to you're looking for historical yeah background? is there any is there any historical significance to us with that marsh so i potentially um it, Tanya might even be the better person to answer this question. Uh, it is home to, you know, a, a plethora of different species that Six Nations would have used for hunting, sustenance, or gathering medicines, things like that. Um, so from that kind of ecological importance, Mother Earth perspective, um, there is some significance there. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nyawa, for that uh, question, Greg, in response. Lauren, further questions or comments? Helen. I'm just moving the motion. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Helen, it's moved by Helen. Is there a seconder? I'll second, Sherry Lynn. Seconded by Sherry Lynn. Are there any further questions or comments? Sorry, Phil, I seen you uh, come off screen. Did you have further comment or question on this one? Oh, no, just a uh, comment back to um, Councillor Fraser is that it's included in part of our litigation lands as well. So we have a direct protective obligation on all of this, by all means. Okay, you know, for that, Phil. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved by Helen and seconded by Sherry Lynn. Looking to any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading? I'll move. I'll move. Sherry Lynn. Moved by Helen, seconded by Sherry Lynn to waive second reading on the previous motion just passed. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Lauren, moving on to 7-3. Uh, again, which reads, uh, this is in relation to the consultation and accommodation uh, uh, CAP team activity report. So whereas the CAP team provides a monthly report to Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council, via political liaison on their activities that is accepted as information and whereas this month's cap report is attached and therefore be it resolved that the six nations of the grand river elected council accept the september to october 2022 consultation and accommodation team get activity report as information so looking to see if there's any further questions comments on any specifics within that report Looking to Taylor, maybe Taylor, if you want to highlight anything on that report. Or Lonnie. Further questions, comments? Actually, I think, I don't know whether our, our Peter Jones is uh, is also might be with us too, but he's uh, he's been filling in since uh, our, um, <clears throat> 
um, um, Robin Vanstone left us in September, so I don't know. He might have a comment on it. Okay. Actually, with the absence of uh, Robin, uh, Taylor pitched in, did the uh, did the report, so I haven't seen it myself. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Peter. Uh, sorry, uh, Taylor. Uh, maybe just highlight the uh, the one Caledonia development uh, in case any uh, issues arise in the future. Uh, it's on 380 Argyle Street. We did have a meeting with the uh, developer, uh, Haldeman County, and um, yeah, just, just those two. I was going to say us, but yeah, us. We obviously we were there. Um, and then, and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, we have ongoing. Um, and then we did meet with the Farmers Association about the Arcal Research Station, as requested last time. Uh, they um, were supportive of it, they, but they do want to have a site visit. So we're uh, currently coordinating that with the RCAL team and then the Farmers Association for when their availability is to go look at the site. Um, and then they would like to come back and discuss that after. Thanks. Uh, thanks for providing uh, that update, uh, Taylor. Uh, Sherry Lynn? I was just okay. moving it to you. Okay, um, perfect. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Sherilyn. So it's moved by Sherilyn to accept uh, the CAPS team activity report for September to October. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Greg. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, that leads us into recommendation 7-4. Again, I'll just read it just for those uh, viewing on online. Whereas again, this uh, the Ministry of Transportation Ontario has two panels uh, to go in Oost State Park, one for Six Nations of the Grand River and one for the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation. And they would like Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approval on the wording of the panels. And whereas on the advice of the lawyers from Blake's, approval should only be given for the Six Nations of the Grand River panel and not for the Mississaugas of the Credit panel. Therefore, be it resolved that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approve the wording on the Six Nations of the Grand River panel that will be placed at Ooze St. Park and be it further resolved that Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council oppose the Mississauga of the Credit panel because it is historically inaccurate. So that's the current uh, motion on the agenda. Looking to see uh, Lonnie or Taylor or whoever else could speak to anything further on this motion. Maybe I'll check in with Lonnie. If there's anything further you wanna add? No, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Uh, I mean, we have been, uh, involved with this uh, Cuga Bridge, you know, since what, 20, 2013, no, 2011, 2012, when it was in the news and uh, uh, it was being stopped construction all the time. And then, but we continue to talk with MTO uh, about uh, recognizing, you know, that this was in our treaty area and that uh, we should be getting some recognition for that fact. So, uh, so talking to MTO, they, we we talked to preparing our panels for Six Nations, but they they also uh, feel that uh, new credit somehow has to be involved, and we've always opposed that. But that's their position. So uh, so <clears throat> Taylor has explained it right that we don't uh, we don't condone what they're doing with respect to the plaque for new credit uh, uh, because it's historically inaccurate. And uh, we will uh, we'll let them know that uh, we're opposed to that, uh, to, to any plaque being there with respect to the Mississaugas. Thank you, now uh, uh, Lonnie for that uh, update or further uh, briefing. Uh, looking to further questions, comments, council, and if not, uh, mover and seconder to the uh, effect. Chief. Kerry. I'd be happy to move that. Okay, thank you. Now, Kerry, it's moved by Kerry. Is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Nathan. Are there any further questions or comments? 
Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I'll move. Moved by Carrie. Seconder? Second. Second by Nathan to waive second reading. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, okay, so, uh, recommendation seven five. Uh, again, this is uh, whereas and if this uh, for those online, whereas the Six Nations of the Grand River has four properties located off the territory uh, that are in the process of being added to the reserve or could be so in the future, and whereas all the properties have uh, the the, the palatated houses and other buildings and structures that are health and safety concerns that need to be demolished and the material hauled away as soon as possible. And whereas we are making efforts to remain in compliance with city bylaws, and where Six Nations of the Grand River has a tendering policy that requires three quotes over $50,000, and whereas time is of an essence to have this work completed, and whereas A6N Company and subsidiary of the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation has the capacity to demolish all of the buildings and haul the debris away, therefore be it resolved that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approve sole sourcing to A6N Company to demolish all the dilapidated buildings. Sorry, I'm not sure why I'm having a tough time pronouncing that word. <laughs> and structures to haul away all debris on the four properties located at 431 West Street, Brantford, 200 number nine Haldeman Road, the Sloat property at Little Buffalo, and the Dijak property located at Old Onondaga Road and to provide those quotes to the chief executive officer for approval before any work is commenced. So looking for any further uh, questions, comments on this motion, I see Hazel has her hand raised. Uh, maybe just before I go to Hazel, Lonnie, did you have anything further that you'd like to add? It's just that, uh, you know, with respect to two of the properties, uh, the Slope property at Little Buffalo and the uh, and the property at 431 West Street, uh, the uh, bylaw officers are, uh, are breathing uh, down my neck about getting these places cleaned up. And so uh, we do have that fund that, uh, you know, that we established years ago, uh, ACDEV fund, that uh, there is $1.9 million in there that could be accessed to do the cleanup. So hopefully that, uh, that could be approved so it could be done as soon as possible. And I just wanted to say that, Peter and I went and looked at the 431 West Street. We had to do the cleanup uh, of the place around the, uh, uh, close to the street there. We had to have all the buildings boarded up and so forth. Uh, you might be aware of that. Uh, but we didn't realize the property was so huge. And we went back to uh, it's 200 yards back from the street. And there's been, uh, there's a little shanty tent back there too that uh, appears somebody's been using. So. All of these things need to be destroyed and and uh, and uh, and material hauled away. Uh, so it, it's going to be a significant amount of uh, of labor. In addition, there's a lot of fallen trees that need to be cut up, and the timber needs to be hauled away. So, uh, uh, so but all of them have significant buildings. I mean, the uh, the Dijak property has that house, and it has. Uh, uh, barn buildings, shed buildings, and it even has a grain silo there, a uh, metal grain silo, which is pretty huge. So, uh, it, and that has for the ATR process, we need to get that done so that it can be added to the reserve sooner rather than later. So uh, uh, it's a lot of work and I just want to get started on getting it done as fast as we can. And I don't want to run up, uh, you know, I want to be, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have to, uh, recognize that we can't have unlimited costs on this. So that's why I want to bring back the estimates back to uh, the CEO to see what uh, what his opinion on is before any work starts. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lonnie, for providing us further uh, briefing on this uh, on this matter. Um, I'll look back to Hazel. Yeah, I'll move on this resolution. Okay, thank you, uh, Hazel. It's moved by Hazel. Is there a seconder? I'll second it. Seconded by Greg. Further questions, comments? 
Just uh, just really quickly, uh, Lonnie, you know what I would love to see even further, and I'm glad to actually see this happening in mm -hmm. terms of the cleanup. Uh, now plans, and I know Sherry Lynn has touched on, 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 a, on a couple uh, pieces of this. Now, what are we going to do with these plans? I think uh, regardless of which, or rather properties, uh, you know, I think we could all, uh, and we all know, uh, you know, what happens when we talk about ATR and, the, and mm -hmm. how long of a process that takes. But I think, you know, even while that process is taking place, um, let's start to do something with these properties, regardless of, of yeah. waiting for ATR to, to, to happen. I'm just wondering if maybe we could start to shift our minds uh, of, you know, future plans of these yeah. properties and what that looks like. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think we'll take that, yeah, definitely under advisement to, uh, uh, you know, Phil has been involved with us too, a lot of this. So, uh, and he's part, actually part of Orno with me as, no, I don't own it. I, uh, but the corporation <laughs> owns some of those properties. So uh, uh, yeah. we're just directors of the corporation. Directors of the corporation. Council yeah. owns those properties. Yeah, so uh, the yeah, we'll take that and we'll, we'll take that in on our advisement, try to come up with a plan for council sure. on that. Yeah, I just in uh, just on that piece, just because you know, it gives us more of a, you know, we're not going to wait around. Basically, just you know, further our, our sovereignty, I guess, in a sense mm -hmm. of saying, if we got plans, or if we have something that we need to do, then and that those properties work for whatever that looks like, then by all means, let's do it. Uh, Derek. Yeah, I just wanted to echo the sentiment that you're that you're expressing and bringing forward is that point of leverage. You know, that process takes forever. But if we have plans or we have some con concepts that we we put in place for the for the various properties, then it, and it serves our our gaps, our needs. Um, then I think that that's the key. And I can just share with council as preliminarily that you know through our infrastructure task force that we have explored a number of options for some of those properties, in particular the the West Street property, um, but also you know Alani spoke to the one on the Dijak and uh, buildings are dilapidated, but you know working with social as well to see whether there's any of the the structures that could be retrofitted to to serve some needs as well uh, so rather than just kind of going down and just completely demolishing everything uh, that one is going to have another sort of checkpoint so that's all part and parcel to the to uh, providing us with the uh, I guess the agency to go ahead and, and do this work um, yeah so I, I, I could add more but uh, there's more comes to council probably very soon on on some of these these concepts Aaron thanks uh, thanks for that uh, okay, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I move, Hazel. Moved by Hazel to waive second reading. Seconder. Second by Greg. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, okay, the next item uh, will be uh, for, we're just waiting for documentation uh, uh, for the report for Councillor Sherry Lynn. Uh, so we'll we'll look to add that on the next agenda. Uh, so that does lead me to our adjournment. Oh, uh, well, uh, or actually, he, sorry, just sorry. Go ahead, Lonnie. Yeah. So I did contact the lawyers. They said they can make it tomorrow night around. I said it'd be in camera around seven thirty. Yeah, that works. I've also uh, sent a text off to Tammy to advise Shirley of that change. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So we don't need okay, to worry thanks about for that, that Lonnie. Okay. And actually, uh, Council, I do have one new business item, which is just a scheduling item. And this is for Greg uh, as a resolution uh, for myself and Greg. I think uh, Helen's already good uh, for tomorrow's ISC joint gathering meeting. Uh, so just want to have resolution uh, for Greg to uh, be able Almost. to. Almost. Sure, by Lynn. Jerry Lynn, seconder. Second, Nathan. Second by Nathan for the question comment. Uh, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I'll move. Moved by Sherry Lynn. Seconder. Second. Second. Second by Nathan to waive second reading on the previous motion. All in favor? 
Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. So that does complete our political liaison uh, agenda for today. Uh, at this point in time, I'll look to a motion to adjourn. I'll move it, Shirley. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Seconded by Greg. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Niala, to everybody for joining us uh, this morning on Political Liaison, uh, and we look forward to seeing you and joining in on tomorrow's General Council uh, meeting. Uh, have a great day.